Das versus Sabatello. Guys, here is why it matters. Look, I gotta put myself in this. I am a leader within the grappling community and I wanted stocks. The first time that I ever saw him compete, I remember being in the second row and going, okay, this guy is going to be champion. So now I gotta stock him because I don't know who he is. He finally goes over to Coach Rufus. So I go to Coach Rufus to get to the bottom of who this guy is so that I get his phone number and I can bring him in. Why do I bring up his grappling prowess? Because your eyes could be lying to you if you watch him fight. You might even argue with me and say, Chael, Stotts is somebody who bludgeons his opponent. I don't disagree with you, but he always puts them in a precarious position before he does it. That will start to wear you down. And when you start to talk about the Italian gangster, he doesn't get worn down. The Italian gangster believes in himself. These are two guys who want and deserve a lot of attention. And when the fight comes to an end, when they hand that microphone to anybody, it's called a microphone. When they hand it to the Italian gangster, it's known as a pipe bomb. And if you want to hear what he has to say first, he's got to get his hand raised. And that is why it matters. Hey, Bellator Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. The final four of the Bellator MMA Bantamweight World Grand Prix is comprised of volatility. You want to do something? Come in here right now and do something. As well as camaraderie. Regardless of acrimony. You won yourself an ass whooping. So congratulations. Or affection. I have nothing but respect for him. He's going to elevate my game. A shot at the million dollar prize. And tournament championship is one fight away. The fuse is lit for more pyrotechnics. Archuleta's down! It's over! In the Rafion Stotts, Danny Sabatello semifinal scrap. The For Patchy Mix and Magomed Magomedov, it's not personal. Wow! It's all business when friends must become foes on the other side of the bracket. And now the new! Also tonight, a rematch of a controversial title fight. We've got a new flyweight champion! The reigning flyweight champion, Liz Carmouche, seeks to validate her crown while the former belt holder, Juliana Velasquez, hungers for payback. The Bellator cage is the home of high stakes, high emotions, and a holiday gift to MMA fans. Twenty-two Mohegan Sun is where we will unwrap Bellator's biggest holiday gift to you thus far. We are getting ready for an unbelievably stacked card here tonight. Everyone anxious to see who will snag the final two spots in the Bantamweight World Grand Prix Final. And tonight it is not just one, but two belts on the line. 
Welcome inside the Mohegan Sun Arena. I am Amanda Guerra alongside two-time world champ Josh Thompson. And all night with us here on the fight desk, the Bantamweight champ himself, Sergio Pettis. Uh, you got the belt at home, but you got some bling. Speaking of the bling, like I can't help. Look how fancy that is. Yeah, I've been trying, man. I've been uh, taking some punches, some kicks to buy some, some jewelry and stuff. I've got to be smarter, though. Josh is giving me some, some stuff about it. <laughs> he's giving you side eye because he's jealous. Every time a fighter comes on, they're just trying to outdo me. What's up, brother? What's we up? We have to, man. You guys, you got a good, uh, good resume. Amazing. Yeah. I You're compete. just not a young whippersnapper anymore, Josh. <laughs> All right, here. Look, Sergio, I do want to mention, look, you are the Bantamweight champ. You were unable to be in this tournament. You were actually supposed to fight in the first round. Rafion Stotts, your really good friend, you got hurt. What has it been like for you being the title holder but having to watch all this unfold? Um, talk about a humbling year. You know, last year was a big year for me. I uh, got the belt, got my most viral knockout, uh, and then tear my ACL, you know. So it was a humbling year. Um, I got to sit back and really enjoy the game, you know, enjoy life a little bit, spend some time with my mom, spend some time with my, my fiance, my dogs. Um, not have to worry about a diet, so that's, that's always great. But, um, you know, not only that, you know, I, I got to learn the other side. Uh, I got to be able to coach and be able to uh, watch the game and be up here for the first time. So this is new for me. This is outside of uh, my comfort zone. Was it, was it a sense of relief, though, that you didn't have to fight Rafion Stotts? Um, Not yes, yet. Yes and no. Yeah. yeah, yes and no, because, you know, I, I feel like no matter what, I'm going to end up fighting Rafi on Stotts. I believe he's going to be the winner of this tournament, and no matter what, his, um, our date just got pushed back, you know, so that's, that's how I view it. Um, definitely tough, you know, I've been knowing the guy my whole life. I mean, not my whole life, but like six, seven years of my fight career. I was there for him in the beginning of his career before he made it to the big scene, so it's been awesome to watch that, uh, but it's also crazy, you know, that we're in this situation. We get to see Rafi on tonight, so let's take a look at the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix bracket. We started with eight of the best in the world. We are now down to these four there. You do have Sergio Pettis' good friend, Rafi on Sops, the interim champ, keeping that belt warm right now, going up against the trash-talking Danny Sabatello. Also, Patchy Mix going up against Magomed Magomedov. Guys, I'm almost sad that tonight is over, especially between Stotts and Sabatello. Uh, Josh, how excited are you for this one? I'm pumped because I don't think the trash-talking is going to stop. It's going to continue in the cage. When someone doesn't get a takedown, they're going to let the other person know. When someone does get a takedown, they're going to let the person know. You know as well as I know being around Rafael Stotts. He's a joker. He's a kid, sir. All of those things. But he's a performer. He's an entertainer. And so in that case, he's going to continue, continue to do what he's doing. Oh, for sure. You know, this, this fight, is the trash talking is not going to stop. I think it's just the beginning of something. You know, I feel like either one of these guys are going to be like, yo, I want that rematch. Or, you know, is um. A big fight for everybody, you know. I, it's the first time I really tuned into somebody outside of, um, you know, like, I guess like the top five, top six. You know, Danny Sabatello came out of nowhere talking this big game, and he's been walking the walk. So um, I'm excited to see tonight. We'll see if he can back it up really quickly. You do want to mention on the other semifinal, or excuse me, yeah, semifinal to get to the final, Patchy Mix versus Magomed Magomedov. You actually trained with Patchy Mix a while. He's a dark horse in this tournament, it seems like. For sure. Pat Patchy is very under the radar. Um, he's got a, a skill set that once he gets there, it's a, it's a tough night for anybody. I've had him on my back before, and man, it was a, a nightmare. So once he gets there, we'll see how, how he does tonight. And Margamedov brings the wrestling along with the caliber of jiu-jitsu and training that Sambo style training as well with the Taekwondo style of stand-up with the spinning attacks. All of those things, it really makes for a great semifinal matchup. Well, we also have more bad blood on the card tonight. We are talking about the women's flyweight title between Juliana Velasquez and Liz Carmouche. This one a rematch here back in April in Hawaii. These two faced off when Juliana was the champ. She was undefeated at the time. Liz Carmouche took the belt from her that night, but a lot of people think that fight was stopped too soon. Juliana says the past is in the past, but she was livid over that call and losing the belt. She says she is twice as motivated to win it back tonight. So much on tap for us, but to kick off the prelims, let's send it down to our guys, Morrow and Big John McCarthy. Thank you very much, Amanda. We end the evening with the second of two semifinal scraps in the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix. We begin tonight's proceedings at Bellator 289 Mohegan Sun Arena in the Bantamweight division. Two fighters looking to get back on the winning track. Jared Scoggins, who is 10 and 2 with four knockouts, takes on Cass Bell, who is 5 and 2 with a knockout and three submission wins. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome tonight's first fighter to the cage. This is Jared Psycho Skaggins. 
27 year old Scoggins well his uh, Bellator debut didn't go according to plan John in fact his scale fail put a few extra loonies and toonies in the pockets of my fellow Canadian Josh Hill who proceeded to knock out Scoggins 56 seconds into round two he has to not only bounce back from a loss in his Bellator debut, but a, a KO one at that. Yeah, it was a big KO, but you know, when you're watching Jared Scoggins, this guy has got a ton of talent and a ton of confidence, and that is that is a key factor in coming back off of a loss like that, is not to lose that confidence. Know how good you are, and trust me, he does. And he said he earned a hard lesson by losing not only the fight, but that extra income this stage of his career looking to uh, Definitely showcase that good footwork, his proficient kicks, and his wide variety of spinning attacks as he gets set to meet Cass Bell. And now we welcome the Mean Green fighting machine, Cass Bell. All seven of Bell's professional mixed martial arts battles have taken place in the Bellator cage, and he got off to a uh, fantastic 5-0 and start, but coming off of back-to-back -back defeats, but he took steps up in competition, including facing uh, a man who will be facing Danny Sabatello in the semifinals of our uh, Bantamweight World Grand Prix, the main event tonight, Rafael Stotts, and coming off a loss to Jornel Lugo. Yeah, and you're taking a look at both guys. Now, Stotts had one loss. Lugo had zero when Bell faced him. Bell is an outstanding wrestler. He's got great wrestling, great submissions. He is dangerous everyone on the ground. So these guys match up as far as that striker versus grappler. This is going to be really interesting. All right, let's take a closer look at the numbers, the tail of the tape for our first fight of the Bellator 289 prelims. And you take a look at both young fighters, but you can see a lot more experience in the cage at a younger age for Jared Scott at 27 compared to Cass Bell at 35. For the first time tonight, let's hear the dulcet tones of Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Mohegan Sun Arena as we kick things off tonight here at the Bellator 289 prelims with three five-minute rounds in the bantamweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot seven, weighing in 135.2 pounds. His professional record: 10 wins, two losses. He fights out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. Presenting Jared Psycho Scoggins. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at 5'10, weighing in 136 pounds, even as a professional. He brings five victories, two defeats. He fights out of Humboldt County, California. Introducing the main green fighting machine, Cass Bell. In charge of the action, your referee, Brian Miner. Cass Bell, head coach at Arcata High School. Coaches the wrestling team there. Special shout out to his kids ready? and for Scoggins. Well, this is something he has done his entire life. The first round is underway. Three of Scoggin's four knockout wins have come in the opening round. Got a start in Kempo Karate, and you can see the stance showing signs of a karate background, John. Yeah, absolutely. You see those hands are low, very Stephen Wonderboy Thompson-like, and he is from the same area. The, these guys have competed against each other, around each other. Him and his brother have been in the martial arts for their entire life. And man, I'll tell you what, when he gets going, look out. For the 35-year-old Bell, striking still, a work in progress. Southpaw launching the overhand left and willing to throw with Scoggins. So a nice early exchange here. Head kick by Scoggins, late kick by Bell. So right from the opening bell. They go at it, John, as you would expect at 135 pounds. That's what you would expect. But if you're cast bell, you have to be reasonable about you what go? you have sure. going on. Well, don't even, worry, don't even was, worry about that. Yeah, Bell, bell looking to a jingle <laughs> Scoggins bell with the, or bells with that or into shot. Uh, just over a minute gone here in the opening frame. Southpaw Bell again fainting with that 
left kick. Scoggins' hands are low. Quick lead calf kick by Scoggins. And if you're cast bell, you really want to start to look towards changing levels. It doesn't mean that you're going to get the takedown, but at least faint the change and make Scoggins have to at least think about what you are looking at it to do. Don't be in this, I'm going to be in a stand-up war with a stand-up guy. Exchanging leg kicks. Bell wanting to get Scoggins to bite on his face. Scoggins not doing so. Catches the kick, though, and looking to take Bell off his feet. Well defended by Bell as he's pinned up against the fence. That was a nice job of catching the kick by Scoggins. Bell did a nice job. He didn't grab the cage. He pushed off it. He can do that. But if you're looking at this position right now, Scoggins has that nice underhook, but does he really want to take Cass Bell to the ground? Yeah, Bell looking to frame there with the right arm as we near the midpoint of the first round. The body lock by Scoggins, overhooks by Bell, so they continue to jockey for position. Shoulder strike to the jaw by Scoggins, trying to get Bell to, to loosen his grip. Scoggins doing a nice job with those shoulder shrugs and using his head as a third arm. You see him pushing that head to the side. Anytime you see Caspell's head going to the side, that's weakening him as a fighter. He's not near as strong. Two minutes remain in the opening round, and Bell able to switch places with Scoggins. And this is what I want. When you start to play into the strength of your opponent, you're looking and saying, why are you going to do that? I want to get separation from Cass Bell if I'm Jared Scoggins. I don't want to be in this grappling exchange. Yeah, Bell's been wrestling since the seventh grade, coaching wrestling for 10 years, and Scoggins able to again put Bell's back to the fence. Scoggins growing up in a family of fighters. His brother Justin, also a professional mixed martial artist. His other brother Jake, really the one who introduced him to the martial arts. And Bell talked about the advantages he would have or the ones he would feel he would have against Scoggins, being a Jiu-Jitsu ground belt, he feels that he is much stronger on the ground, but he's feeling the strength of Scoggins here in this clinch and, and unable to not only break the clinch, but take the fight to his preferred destination. And the truth is, Scoggins has done a great job with that underhook. You look where he's at with his arms right here, that head position. He's able to land those short little elbow strikes. Everything he's doing is great. He's basically telling Cass Bell, hey, I'm not just a stand-up guy. I will grapple with you, and I will just systematically beat you down. Keep working, keep working. Both Referee imploring both athletes to keep working. Bell pleading his case, saying, hey, what do you expect me to do? I expect you to get out. That's what I expect you to do. Change and Bell position. trying to do that, lace in the leg. And now he's got those overhooks, but it's still there. They continue to reverse position, and with the final seconds counting down here in the first round, Scoggins and Bell remain attached to each other. Stop. I know. Here, take, take, take it. Take it down. You want to take it? Take your time. You don't have to get desperate. You have the range. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're doing just fine. Like, yeah. don't, if, you, if you are going to let your hands go, just keep one up. 13, 13, 13. In that firefight, you have more range, so don't get too close in the firefight. You good with the water? Yeah. How you feel? Feel good? Yeah. You're in shape, man. You're not tired. Yeah. We, we got this. Down. All right, yeah. Not Rock it out. Strong. No. Just use your range, though. Yep. Use your range more. And then when you're ready, then you walk up. Yeah. Just come back with something, though. If he touches you, you touch him back. If he touches you, you touch him back. Right. Yeah. If you miss a kick, yeah. follow up something. Yeah.
round number two, uh, John, the uh, fights scored under the unified rules of MMA. A quick uh, rundown of the criteria and how you scored the first round. Well, that criteria is based upon effective striking or grappling, which one took place more in that first round, and that was grappling. And if you take a look at the grappling that really occurred and the strikes, it was Jared Scoggins that should have won that round 10-9. Muted offensive attack in that first frame after a frenetic start because of the the clinch work of both Scoggins and Bell from a defensive position for the most part. And you heard Bell's corner, a nice counter left hand by Bell, but Scoggins fires off the body kick. They want him to find his range. Yeah, they actually want him to stay at range, use his length. But the problem is Good counter takedown by Scoggins. Right now, you see Caspell reaching over the top. He's not going to be able to hold that position. So what he wants to do is he's going to have to lace that arm underneath the head of Scoggins, start to get himself back towards his feet. If he can sit there and turn towards him, exactly what he's trying to do, it's going to help him, but it's not going to be easy for him. Nice job by Scoggins. He's pushing, put a lot of pressure down under that arm, driving his head towards the canvas. And all Jared Scoggins needs to do is take his time in this position. He is in a great position right now. He's got those legs of Caspell where he wants him. His is the one that's actually controlling it. He's moving towards the arm triangle. Nice reversal by Bell. Back to his feet. Knee and Bell trying to take the back of Scoggins, but a good escape by Bell. Very nice escape. He waited for Jared Scoggins to try to make that move to the side so he could get that arm triangle in place. As soon as he went to it, Caspell move. Yeah, Bell drags uh, Scoggins to the mat. And this is where Caspell should be trying to fight Jared Scoggins. Blood on the face of uh, Scoggins. Yeah, I'm not sure how that happened. I'm not sure if that was uh, as they got up or what. He's got a, a little cut seems to be over his right eye. Bell looking to pop his head out. Improved position. Butterfly hooks employed here by Scoggins. Looking to just control Bell who's in top position, which again, we talked about, this is an area where Bell thought he would be the stronger of the two athletes. Midway point of the round and the fight. You know, and An I, opener by Bell, trying to break the grip. You're not, you're not gonna, gonna, <laughs> you use a can opener to break a closed guard. You don't use it when someone's got hooks in. Unless you're Mark Kirk, maybe back in the day. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Just over two minutes left here in the second stanza, and uh, it's Scoggins working from his back, controlling the posture of Bell. And what you're seeing right now, Cass Bell needs to up that the motion, all of the all of the strikes and everything need to start coming into play. Don't sit here and just control the position. You want to damage him. You want to prove to the judges that you are trying to finish this fight. High close guard employed by Scoggins. Winner of five of his last six fights, but again, an ignominious. Look at Bellator the MMA debut, looking for the submission from the bottom. Jackhammer shots from Bell, creating some space from top position. Yeah, he should, he should have held that space. When you got that posture and the ability to land big strikes, continue on, don't stop. And now, Scoggins is in even better position defensively because he's against the fence here in terms of trying to get back to his feet. Get back to his feet, correct. Although he's content to keep that closed guard while Bell tries to posture. A minute left in the second. Scoggins, you can see, starting to get a little bit more tired from all of the, the motion, trying to create the angles you're seeing him in right now. He needs to be really careful of that right elbow of Cass Bell. 45 seconds remaining in the second. Bell working from top position. Scoggins keeping a tight guard, but Bell unable to maximize this top position. And now some short right strikes to the side of Scoggins' head. See Scoggins with that right hand trying to control the head position of Caspell, keep him close so he can't land a big strike. There's an elbow. Couple of rights and 10 seconds remaining in the second. Beautiful job. Take a look at the right foot of Caspell holding that left bicep.
Take a look here. This might be the one that cuts him right there. That beautiful left hand right on the brow. Same punch, different angle. Scoggins changes into that level, gets a, that body lock and beautiful takedown of Cass Bell. But when he went for that arm triangle, he lost position and ended up getting taken down himself. Good movement. Third and final round of this bantamweight division battle between Jared Scoggins and Cass Bell, both looking to get back in the win column. Third and final round, they touch gloves. John both secured a takedown in the middle frame with Bell out throwing and out landing Scoggins in that second stanza. How did it impact your unofficial scorecard? Right now I have this fight as even. It is at 19 apiece. And so this is the round that's gonna make the, the decision for the judges, in my opinion. The, both guys need to go after it and go after it with the intent on finishing. Side kick delivered by Scoggins, and again, known for his kicking, although has been unable to deliver a lot in there. Nice job by Bell with the wizard. As he's on the neck, but he's got that with the arm in. Not a good position from trying to attack that guillotine right now. You see how Scoggins is blocking that right leg, making sure that he doesn't jump into guard trying to pull him in. Two of Bell's three submission wins are via guillotine choke. Last one against Isaiah Roca at Bellator 226 in September of 2019. He put him to sleep at 121 of the first. We've seen that Cass Bell has good submission ability. The The real, the real, you know, uh, surprising part for me is how much Jared Scoggin is employing grappling in this fight against Cass Bell. But uh, in the clinch work against the cage, he's been the superior fighter. Scoggins looking to up. elevate Bell, take him down. Elf. Bell posts with his left arm. You can see Bell's going to want to get that left leg free. He's going to swing it inside so he can put it to the ground. The worst thing he can do is allow Scoggins to keep this position right now and stay with his back on the fence. He shields there. Back all the way up on the fence. 245 left in the fight. And according to Big John McCarthy's unofficial scorecard, the fight very much hanging in the balance in this final frame. High guard employed by Bell, but wide base by Scoggins. Just putting all of his weight on Bell and the referee warning Bell to keep his toes from interlocking with the cage. Well, Bell was trying to use that to be a pivot point so he could swing his body in for an armbar attempt. He's trying to swivel his hips, but again, running out of real estate against the, the fence, but you've already mentioned it. Surprised at Scoggins' strategy in this fight. Yeah, but like I said, up against the cage, he's been the superior fighter. Now in the top position here, using the cage to keep Cass Bell in this position. He's Controlling, being... top position. He's winning this round. Yep, and elbow strikes. Fans getting restless here in our opener with Scoggins controlling Bell along the fence, just grinding away. Bell needs to be really careful about Give up his giving back, back here up. That leg is the only thing that's keeping him right now. He's got to keep that up. And for Scoggins, nice job of standing back up by Cass Bell. Four knockouts yet to record a submission win. So Scoggins again, Bell back to his feet. Bell has Scoggins on the fence now. Minute 20. Bell opening up momentarily before clinching again. Scoggins with a knee and Bell creating some space under hook. Now it's Scoggins looking for the 10 finger guillotine. Scoggins looking for that guillotine. He has the ability to make that happen if he gets his looking, legs engaged. First, looking for his first submission win. He does not have it right now at all. He's got a hold of the head, but there is no ability for him to create enough pressure on a choke to stop Cass Bell. Cass Bell gets back. 
Beautiful transition to Scoggins back. Less than a minute remaining in the fight. Can Bell maximize this position? Trying to put the hooks in. Well defended by Scoggins. 35 left on the fight. Scoggins really trying to hold on to those wrists. Bell wants to get those hooks in so he can try to flatten them out. Bell looking for the dramatic finish. Seconds continue to tick away, looking to put his arm under the neck, but well defended by Scoggins. He's sliding Now he's in. sliding it in. Look, 13 seconds, plenty of time. Knee to the side of Scoggins' body, cast Bell. Well, finish the fight, having the back position on Jared Scoggins. They go the full 15 minutes. Again, both of them needing the victory to get back into the win column. And after three rounds, how do you have it on your unofficial scorecard and why, sir? Well, I don't know. How do you have it there, Morrow? <laughs> As you were watching the same fight as me. And I'm trying to tell the story. And I want to know one thing. I'm looking at Who stats. is the guy at the end of this that was trying to finish the fight? That's really probably what the judges are going to look to. You could say that Scoggins had more time on the ground. What damage did he do? Wasn't a lot. Mitig not much. It was mitigated. And then you and take then a look. He lost the position. The back. Ended up in Dominant a worse position. position with his back taken. So the judges, I think, might go towards Caspell. And that would then be 29-28 on your unofficial yes, it was, sir. Bell trying to snap Thank a two-fight losing streak. Thank you, buddy. I love you guys. And I miss you. Loves to give back to his community there in Northern California. We talk about how much he's loved by the, the kids that or cut a high school where he's been the wrestling love coach for a decade. He's done a fantastic job house, with all the kids there. They all love him because he's just a guy that he walks the walk. They know exactly what he does in the fighting world, and he's there for him. All the tournaments, Caspell is an outstanding example of what a leader should be. The mean green fighting machine hoping to be the Grinch that stole victory away from Jared Scoggins here tonight as we await the official decision. Let's find out. The official decision here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, will go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first AP body scores at 29 to 28. He sees the fight for Bell. Your second judge, Michael Murtha, 29 28. He scores the fight for Scoggins. Your third and final judge at cage side, Dave Bruce, scores at 29 to 28. He sees it for the winner by split decision. The mean green fighting machine, Cass Bell. Cass Bell picks up the much needed W at the expense of Jared Scoggins. And while Bell snaps a two fight losing streak, Scoggins has now dropped back to back fights. Oh, and two here in the Bellator cage, John. Yeah, you know, not an easy fight to lose because he had a lot of good things that he did in here. It was when he allowed Bell to switch that position, get the takedown, and get the back. I think that was the difference in the judges' eyes. And, of course, someone with the surname Bell would win during the holiday season. Isn't that right, Miss Amanda Gera? <laughs> I don't know, more. my last name means war, so I am just always ready for a fight. Speaking of ready for a fight, the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix, we are down to the semifinals. We are going to see these four gentlemen go at it tonight to try to land those final two spots in the final. The winner getting a million dollars. I am here on the fight desk with Josh Thompson. We also have the Bantamweight champ himself, not in this tournament due to an injury, Sergio Pettis. We're going to talk about the trash talking between Danny Sabotel and Rafian Stutz, but I want to bring this up because during the last fight I asked Josh, I 
Chris and Josh, who did you smack talk with the most? And what did you tell me? Your brother. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a big trash talker, even though I had the punk nickname. But it's, it wasn't me. But when I was announced to fight your brother for the title, and we had gone back and forth quite a bit through Twitter and some stuff, but he was probably the one that I talked the most trash to. Got a lot of respect for him, by the way, and you as well. But uh, yeah, he was probably the only one I ever really talked trash to. That's crazy. You're not much of a trash talker. <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, I'm not much of a trash talker. He's got that trait more than I do, but uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I had no idea. Both of you are gentlemen now. All right, Stotts and Sabatello, look, it's played out absolutely everywhere. Social media interviews. Here's what went down when they faced off yesterday. Yo. Let's go. No touching, no touching, what no touching. What you gonna do, you bro? Third or fourth round. You, you say me. what? You want me to finish third or fourth round. You, you ain't never me. finished nobody in your fucking I'll life, bro. You in the third and you or damn sure ain't finished Which one do you want? I guarantee Which that. Which one do you want? What you want to put third on, fourth bro? Round. I'll let you fucking bro, choose. Bro, third or fourth round, I'm gonna fuck you up. You gonna be right. fucked up by then. Okay, here's the belt. Fucked up. Let's okay. go. Face the crowd, guys. Face the crowd. Tim is here, baby. Big fight. Big fight. about that because we're not the ones who are going to be in the cage tonight. Look, though, I mean, you got two guys that are coming from wrestling backgrounds. Stotts is 18 and one, Sabatello 13 and one. Besides the smack talk, Sergio, I mean, how much pressure is actually on these guys for tonight? It's got to be a ton. Oh, a ton of pressure. We got the belt on the line. Not only that, we got a million dollars on the line, obviously, for the next round. So a lot of pressure. Um, definitely adding some more pressure to themselves with that smack talk. But, you know, every athlete is different. Some people need that smack talk to get them going, get them hyped to fight this fight. So, I mean, man, I'm excited. It's going to be a big war tonight. He starts that way in the gym. You train with him for years. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know Six years. That's like the little chirpy. Yeah, yeah. You know what, Stotts, you know, he, he has a, a, a character behind him. He'll, he'll talk some stuff here and there, but uh, this is the first time I've actually seen him, like, really be serious about it. You know, like, Sobatello stro uh, strikes some things uh, that, you know, I think Stotts didn't like. You know, Stotts a grown man, so, <laughs> yeah. He, he's sat at home, I know, at times, like, writing down insults, <laughs> getting ready for this match. We'll see if we can hear him once they face off. Let's talk about the other side of the bracket tonight. We have Patchy Mix going up against Magomed Magomedov. A lot of things to prove for each of these guys as well, especially Patchy Mix. Look, he had his title shot against Juan Archuleta. He lost that. He says, I am a different fighter now. I am a better fighter. Josh, talk to us about what's on the line for each of these guys trying to get to that million dollars. Well, they're trying to both get to the finals, but what I saw out of Patchy Mix was maturity, and you brought it up a lot earlier when we were talking uh, off air, is he slowed down, he understands that he doesn't have to rush in for things, he doesn't have to chase the back, the back will present itself. He is one of the best, if not the best grappler in the sport, not just in the Bantamweight division. He is phenomenal, and everyone who I've talked to and he's trained with, he dominates the positions, not just getting to the back, but on the neck, the guillotines, the arming guillotines, the sweeps, the control, all of those things he does very well. Talk to me more about the maturity you've seen from him though since his last couple fights yeah man uh, like you said he's a master grappler he understands a lot of positions not only does he understand jiu-jitsu he understands wrestling and the full MMA uh, grappling aspect in general he's a good job at blending stuff together but um you know I've trained with him before if that guy gets on your back it is a, a damn nightmare you know I hate that so uh, I, even he's a striker's nightmare so even for me I've been watching out for him for a while um, good friend of mine actually we talk a lot he's a cool guy you know um, we have no bad blood but yeah, I think tonight is going to be his night, personally. They call him the human backpack for a reason. More, I'm going to send it back down to you. I'm going to send it with this because you and I are the nicest ones here. Who's the biggest smack talker out of our group? Is it Big John or Josh? Moro. It's Moro. It's, it's not Moro. <laughs> Moro can spit some bars, baby. He can spit some bars. I'll let I'll let the court of public opinion th uh, just you know do what Josh Thompson is doing there. The best smack talker is by far. The Rock. Let's leave it at that, ladies and gentlemen. We don't lay the smack down. We lay this down for you. We got a welterweight matchup between Michael, the Don Lombardo, Mark Leminger, and again, both of them are hoping for a W for Christmas. And now to make his way to the cage, Michael Lombardo. Thirty-two-year-old Michael Lombardo with a twelve and three record with one no contest. He's one and one here in the Bellator cage, coming off a unanimous decision to Kyle Crutchmer, who we will see compete here tonight on the Bellator 289 prelims. What does Lombardo bring to the cage in this fight? You know what he brings is he's a very good and smart fighter. He, he takes his time. 
He just got out wrestled by a superior wrestler and had to work hard to get back to his feet. In this, he's got another wrestler, but he's got very good kicks, very good low cap kicks, and he just needs to take his time and pick his shots in this fight. Set now to make his way, this is Mark Leminger. Twenty-nine-year-old Mark Leminger started off his career ten and one. Ended up here in Bellator in the summer of 2020. Made his debut in July of that year. Beat Jake Smith via second-round TKO. Unfortunately, then ran into Yaroslav Amosov. Lost via TKO in the first round due to doctor stoppage. But since then. One win, three losses, and trying to snap a two-fight losing streak and trying to bounce back from, well, being on the receiving end of the first buggy choke in Bellator history. Hey, you, you know, going against Oliver Eckham, that, that's a tough task for anyone. The, the real thing with Mark Lemmerger, he's good everywhere. He's just not that guy that, you know, you look at is the striking is good. Not unbelievable. His wrestling is good. Not unbelievable. He just needs to go in there and be the guy that just transitions well. Taking a look, these guys are very similar, almost across the board. A little bit two-inch reach for Lombardo, 12 and five for Leminger, 12 and three for Michael Lombardo. Here is Michael C. Williams. And Rallo's joining us tonight live in the UK on BBC iPlayer. We welcome you to Mohican Sun. For the prelims here at Bellator 289, we'll go now to the welterweight division. Set for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at six foot, weighing in 169.8 pounds. His professional record, 12 victories, three losses. He fights out of Jupiter, Florida, presenting Michael. Lombardo! And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 170.8 pounds as a professional. He brings 12 wins, five defeats. He fights out of Madison, Wisconsin, introducing Mark Leminger. And the referee in charge, Kevin McDonald. Leminger with three wins via first round KO submission while Lombardo he is hoping to again come back successfully from the loss to Kyle Crutchmer. We will see Kyle Crutchmer against Jaleel Willis in welterweight action later tonight as both of them meet in the center of the cage and Chuck Leather. Exchange to get things started, John. Yeah, both guys are actually you know, setting their feet and going after it. Lombardo's had a very nice left hook that he's landed several times. Lemmerger throwing straight shots for the most part. He needs to. Nice uppercut. There's a lead left hook that landed for Lombardo, but Lemminger right in front of him. Lombardo using lateral movement, trying to circle away, plants his feet, delivers another left hook that lands. Lombardo switching back and forth orthodox to southpaw. Leads with the overhand left, follows up with the right. There's a nice step in jab by Leminger. Just needs to shorten I'll make that Lombardo. Yeah, it was Lombardo, exactly. It's all right. Just needs to shorten him up a little bit. Don't round everything off. Straight's going to get there a lot faster. There's a nice left hook upstairs that was delivered by Leminger. Now he flashes the jab. Lombardo utilizing his footwork and attacking the leg with the calf kick, and that forces. Mike Lombardo has been money with that left hook over the yes. top ball. Yes, he has, and it's Leminger trying to find success with his left hand through the guard. Back to orthodox. And again, there is Lombardo sneaking in the jab, counter right from Leminger. So both of them looking to lower the boom here in the first two minutes of the first. And Leminger really looking for that right hand uppercut. And 
Lemminger is already connected on 22 of 52 strikes, while Lombardo 31 of 47. So Lombardo landing more and at a better percentage. And the kick is caught by Lemminger, ends up in top position, feeding Lombardo with the right hands, looking for the guillotine. Nice reversal. Oh, no. That was a nice attempt at the guillotine. Now, he rolled right into it and was smart. Instead of trying to hold on to something and be on the bottom, Lemminger stopped the choke, got back to position, and is now back to reapplying. Two of Lemminger's three submission wins have been via guillotine choke. Lombardo able to get back to his feet, looking for the takedown against the fence, but was able to defend the guillotine choke attempt by Lemminger. Lombardo has never been knocked out or submitted in his career. Lombardo did a nice job of getting those hips back, pulling. Lemberger's hips, you see him trying to climb in that cage wall, get his hips up next to it. Lombardo's been taking and pulling him back. A minute and a half left here in the first round. Lombardo looking to try to improve his position. Lemberger looking to get back to his feet. He's going to be able to. He's going to be on the ground. Just a matter of timing now. Scooping up the leg momentarily. Lemminger back to a vertical base. They continue at close quarters, and Lombardo able to escape. Resets. A minute left in the round. Oh, nice one-two through the guard from Lombardo, and then goes to the body. And Lombardo, if you're watching it, a lot of his punches coming straight down. You know, he does throw the left hook a lot, but straight jab, he's been accurate with it, and it's getting there quicker. Oh, oh. left hook clip. Lemminger dropped him, and it's over. Michael Lombardo with his sixth knockout victory. And for Mark Lemminger, he suffers his fourth knockout loss as he got clipped by Lombardo. And John, you mentioned it throughout the fight. That left hook continued to land, and it paid dividends. Absolutely. That left hook was money for him throughout the fight. He continually went back to it, landed it, and that was what set Mark Lemminger into position. Take a look at what happens here. Nice right hand straight down there. Lombardo consistently used that jab and that left hook over the top, and that's what puts Lemminger down. Take a look at this. Bip, right there on the side of the temple, the Lemberger goes down, and you notice doesn't go into position to protect himself. That's why referee Kevin McDonald comes in and puts a halt to the match. Michael Lombardo lays out Mark Lemminger and records his 13th victory and sixth via form of knockout, making sure his opponent is okay. Good to see Lemminger is okay, other than the fact that he has just suffered his third consecutive loss and all three inside the distance. So a devastating defeat for Lemminger, but a huge win for Michael Lombardo, bouncing back from the setback to Kyle Crutchmer. And Lombardo now two and one under the Bellator banner. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. Four minutes, 23 seconds into round number one. The winner by knockout, Michael Lombardo. And let's go up to Big John McCarthy. I'm here with your winner, Michael Lombardo. Michael, you came into that. You had a tough fight in your last one with a really good wrestler that kept taking you down. In this one, you guys decided we're going to bomb each other on the feet. Yeah, hey, I have so much respect for that guy. He's super tough, man. Seriously. Kyle Kutchman's very tough, too. I'm looking to get back to that fight. I'm going to earn it, though. So I'm saying Levon Chokley in March. Let's do it, bro. He's about top 10. 
let's get it. Let me earn my shot back with Kutchmer, but I'm coming to knock you out. Let's talk about the, one of the big differences we were talking about during your fight was you kept utilizing your jab. It was a straight shot going down, down the middle, and your left hook was money. It landed time after time. Yeah, hey, listen. I, have the, I train the best gym in the world, American Top Team. And I got the two best coaches in the world, King Mo and Dave Zitnick. Dave doesn't get the love that he's supposed to because he's a small town guy. But hey, he's been with me since my first amateur fight for 10 years. That's my brother, and this fight is for him. Well, sounds good. That was a beautiful performance. Congratulations on a big win. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Michael Lombardo. Michael Lombardo giving flowers to his trainers, David Zitnick and King Mo. And for Lombardo, his seventh first round finish, fifth, thanks to his power as he hopes to continue to climb the ranks. And it's all smiles for American top team and Michael Lombardo. All right, let's go back to Amanda Guerra at the fight desk. Moro, thank you. Incredible finish there from him. Taking a look at our main card we have coming up tonight. You do not want to miss a single second of this starting 9 Eastern on Showtime 6 Pacific there. It is going to be absolutely incredible. We have the semifinals of the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix. The final four, Rafian Stutz, Danny Sabatello. They have been talking trash. Patchy Mix going up against Magomed Magomedov. They are friends, but say once that cage door closed, it is an all-out war, but I want to talk about our co-main event, the women's flyweight division. Liz Carmouche was the current champ going up against Juliana Velasquez. Guys, the last time we saw these two women in the cage, it was back in April. Juliana Velasquez was the champ. She lost to Liz Carmouche. Going back to the flashback, we have the video, though. A lot of people said this ended way too early. Josh, you were very vocal about the way this ended. I was very vocal that night. Um, you're taking someone's O away, Sergio. It's very important as a referee, judges, any of those things, to take that into consideration. This this situation, she was getting hit with the shots. We've been putting those positions in training over and over again and been elbowed, been punched. We're used to that. We understand it. She was still bridging. She explain was not that, out. Explain that. So her, her, her hips, her were hips still were still up. up. Big John's going to explain it a lot throughout the night. But she had her hips still up. She was still bridging, trying to get she trying to get her arms free. She she took a shot, which was normal, but she kind of she kind of froze for a second. But that's not the opportunity to stop the fight. Not when the title's on the line. Not when both fighters have so much experience, and not when someone has no. Is it hard, Sergio, if you feel cheated at all when if, if a fight ever ended too early for you or you felt that you could have kept going? You know, the, I was on the on the opposite end where I was finishing the guy and they stopped the fight too soon and I was like, it takes away from both athletes, you know, it takes away from, especially when there's a belt on the line, like you said, if there's an O on the line, you know, let, let them fight it out, let's see how far it goes. It might have been a, a position where she might have finished her a couple of seconds later on, but, um, you know, let them, let them answer that question, you know, now we got an unanswered question that we're going to find out tonight. So, looking at the fight tonight, Josh, from each of the these women. I mean, you have Liz saying Juliana, the only reason she's getting to fight tonight is because she threw a temper tantrum. You have Juliana saying the only reason Liz has the belt is because the ref gifted it to her. I mean, their mentality coming in tonight. How is it for each of them? Well, Sergio can, Sergio can say the same thing, I believe, is that just they've got to put all that behind them. And this is a new night, a new opportunity to really solidify whether you are the champion or whether you get your belt back. And that's really what it comes down to. All that other stuff doesn't matter. What matters is tonight. Agreed, agreed. You got to put everything behind you, and tonight is the night, obviously, to answer that question that they both are wondering. So, uh, big fight tonight, man. I'm, I'm hype. I'm hype for all these fights. It's a big, big card. Mora, we'll send it back down to you. All right, it's great to have the Bellator Bantamweight champion, Sergio Pettis, joining us tonight as we get set for action in the featherweight division. Kevin, game time fame against Kai fighting Hawaiian Kamaka the third again. Both looking to get back into that win column. And now, ready to make his way to the cage, Kevin, game time fame. Twenty-eight-year-old Kevin Fame looking to even his Bellator record to one and one after getting submitted by Ahmed Magomedov at Bellator 283 this past July. One thing you can say about Fame, John, he is teeth tough. 
no doubt about it. This guy is. There's no quit in him, man. He is just a tough guy. He continues to come forward. He continues to take shots at times. You go, how does he take that? And he just shakes it off like it's nothing. Started fighting at the age of 17 while he was still in high school. Was set to join the Marines, but when he got his first taste as a professional fighter, he said, this is what I want to do with my life. And again, this will be his 15th professional fight, looking to move to 10 and 5. He has four knockouts and a submission on his resume. And he's a guy, John, that being durable and stuff, he also loves to apply his craft on the mat where he likes to use that GMP to work for submissions. He definitely likes the ground and pound. There's no doubt about it. That's what he's very good at. If he can take the, his opponent down, which is something he probably should do against Kai Kamaka, he is very dangerous in the top position. Representing American Top Team Portland and 10th Planet Springfield. And now we welcome the fighting Hawaiian Kai Kamaka. City's Kai Kamaka the third. Once he gets into that cage and the bell rings, he is as fast as 5G and has an impressive Bellator record of three and one. But that loss came in his last fight to Justin Gonzalez. A split decision back in April, Bellator 279 in his native Hawaii. Yeah, against Justin Gonzalez. And that's part of the whole thing. That was a split decision loss. It was a close fight, and we know where Justin Gonzalez is at. He's only got one loss on his record. That is to Aaron Pico, and he is moving up in the rankings, and Kai Kamaka wants to show everyone, you know, I deserve to be in those rankings. I deserve another shot at Justin Gonzalez. Let me just get past Kevin Bay. Kamaka was scheduled for a, a quick return a couple of months after his most recent bout, but he had to pull out of that fight with an injury. But now he has to, well, he has to earn that money because guess what? Baby needs a new pair of shoes. He's celebrating the recent birth of his fourth child. And he is, uh, he's too young to have that. <laughs> <laughs> 27 years of age, and he says, and I quote, I don't know how much kids it takes you, but my fourth kid, I feel I'm at a different spot, a more mature spot than what I was going at into my last fight. Well, he, he, Our tail of the tape on this fight, 70-inch reach for Kevin Bain, 68 for Kai Kamaka, but that is not going to stop him. This is a guy that likes to throw his hands and has a ton of speed. All right, let's get the official introductions here once again. Michael C. Williams. Streaming live tonight on YouTube. We welcome all those on both channels, Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, as well as those joining us on Pluto TV for the prelims tonight here at Bellator 289, where we go now to three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner at 5'10", weighing in 145.1 pounds. As a professional, he stands at 9 and 5 by way of Springfield. He fights out of Portland, Oregon, Kevin Game Time Bay. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5'7", weighing in 145.2 pounds. His professional record, nine wins, five losses, one draw out of Pearl City, Hawaii, presenting Kai, the fighting Hawaiian Kamaka. And the referee in charge, Kevin McDonald. Kamaka with an all-star camp in his corner when it comes to great fight. people with great high fight, fight IQs. Go. And for Kevin Bain, representing a gym that uh, he trains with former Bellator lightweight champ Brent Primus. But when you look at Kamaka's corner, the likes of Eric Nixick who will also be in the corner of Rafion Stotts in the main event of Bellator 289. Coming up later tonight on Showtime when he faces Danny Sabatello in their grudge match 
in the semifinals of the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix, but for Kamaka with the likes of Nick Sick and, and his uncles Ray Cooper and Ronald Jr. who know a thing or two about fighting, he, he's a board fighter. See, it's, it's so bad that, you know, I know those names. I actually referenced those guys when they were fighting. <laughs> uh, Kai Kamaka is a very accomplished fighter. He's, he's just getting better, and he is young. You know, that's why when you talk about four kids, he's still a very young fighter. He's still learning, and he's, the big thing that he needs to do is pull the trigger. He is very fast with his hands, and the more that he gets set into, I'm just gonna throw and throw in combinations, he becomes very dangerous. Just past the minute mark of the opening round, and Bame looking to throw kicks, but instead it's Kamaka with the low kick. Now they're exchanging low kicks. Yeah, you, you could say that they are exchanging them, but there's a difference in the speed and power of Kamaka's compared to Kevin Baines right now, and that's that can add up quicker. That was a quick calf kick by Kamaka as Bain attempted to go upstairs. They can look at that left leg of Kevin Bain already. Look at it looks like almost looks, looks like a candy cane. <laughs> There's a body kick that lands with authority for Kamaka. Left kick to the body, and Bame out of range for those punches. Body kick lands for Bame. Again, Kamaka loading up on the kick, lands the calf kick, and then blocks that Grazing head kick by Bain. Right. But you gotta like the fact that every time Kamaka kicks, Kevin Bain is trying to make him pay. He is and not he initiated that attack there. He is countering. Midway point of the first round lead left hook thrown by Bain. Another body kick by Kamaka, but Bain just misses with the one two. Kamaka really attacking that lead leg of Kevin Bain. Trying to take away Bain's base of power, and there's a sharp jab splitting the guard of Kamaka. And oh, beautiful left hook to deliver the counter as Bain went upstairs with a sweeping left hook. Great timing by Kamaka to go to the body. I figured you would like that one. <laughs> the liver attack. It was very oh, well placed. Right uppercut by Bain on the exit. But it was a good idea by Kamaka to actually get into that. He said, like, hey, I don't mind wrestling. I'll take you down. Make him at least think of it because that's going to open up your stand. Bame doubling up on the jab. Doesn't follow up with the right. That kick checked by Kamaka. Nice footwork, and it results in a crushing calf kick by Kamaka. What a sweet sequence there, John. What a beautiful switch because that was a switch kick to the leg, and it was well done by Kai Kamaka. He just, and again, he's doing well, but he needs to up the pressure, up the outflow on his strikes. I love the fact that Kevin Babe is coming back every time. Both of them have landed a similar amount of kicks, but Kamaka's have been more powerful, and he's had been more successful. And there's another shot to the body, that hurt Bain. That did hurt him. You could see the effect it had on him. You see he's going backwards. He's trying to catch some wind right now. This is the time, dude, if you're Kai Kamaka, you've got to pick that up, and you got to, okay, up the pressure. Kamaka looking for his first knockout win as a professional, and Attacking the body of Kevin Bame with those nasty body kicks. Boy, Kevin Bame tomorrow is not going to be walking well. That leg is getting just tore up. He's going to need a bomb for his body. <laughs> B-A-L-M, of course, but Bame, the gutsy fighter that he is, coming forward. 15 seconds left in the round. This is what I was talking about. He has no give up. He just keeps coming. We mentioned it. Teak, tough. Durable, but in top against the the offense and the kicks of Kai Kamaka. Kamaka adding a few uh, tattoos that Bain didn't ask for in that first round. Bain has a lot of dark ink on him, and that, a lot of it's turning red now. <laughs>
Take a look at these kicks, and these were hard, a lot of them. See it crossing his leg over, taking them off balance throughout this beautiful use of the feet, and look at that beautiful shot to the body and doubles it up. You gotta love when a guy doubles up a hook to the body. Babe tries for the spinning back fist, misses. You can look, take a look at the reaction on the face. That kick to the liver did not feel good. Take him down, please. Take him down. Fabiano Skerner there in the corner of Kevin Bim giving him instructions. Another longtime veteran of the sport. Oh, great guy. And has just been a fantastic coach since he gave up the fight career and turned into the train. Second round underway in the Bellator featherweight division. Kevin Bame in the blue gloves. Kai Kamaka the third in the red. And they both kicked at the same time. You good? All right, let's go. Another low kick lands for Kamaka. And you know, he talks about his grappling strength, saying that's as strong as suited. You've talked about wanting to see more out of his striking game. You're getting that now as he blocks the head kick from Bain. Oh, absolutely, he's, he's upping that intensity. He's upping the volume. And he, he's really utilizing that kick game. And it's just beautiful from what I'm seeing as far as how he's going about it and the damage that he's creating with it. And Bain looking for the takedown, defended nicely by Kamaka. But Bain continues to just stand right in front of you and continues to try to land something. You can see all the red as far as on the liver, even to the right arm. Take a look at that elbow and tricep area. That arm has got beaten up by those kicks also. And Kamaka continues to chop away with calf kicks to the lead leg. Again, a naked shot by Bain, easily defended by Kamaka, who turns it into a... Good position for him before he breaks. Kai Kamaka right now starting to feel really comfortable. Nice He's got job. his head popped back by the jab of Bain. But yeah, the confidence seems to be increasing with every second. Jab to the body by Kamaka. Let's go. Yes. Yes, keep going. Yes. Push forward. Beautiful combination by Kamaka. Downstairs, upstairs, John. Downstairs, upstairs, that left hook landed solid on the jaw of Kevin Bain. Bain checks the kick, goes for a spinning back fist. Swing and a miss. But again, the intent is there for Kevin Bain. He realizes what's happening. He's trying to do something, although he's beginning to labor here, beginning to really feel the effects of the calf kicks, courtesy of Kamaka. All of these shots are starting to add up, and the damage is intensifying. Kevin Bame is hanging tough, and he is still fighting hard. But Kai Kamaka, he, he has just been on fire as far as the accuracy of his shots. The numbers indicate just that. A huge edge now in the striking department for Kai Kamaka the third with two minutes and 15 seconds left in the second. Good punch placement. Maybe would like to see an uptick in those combinations. Has been successful going to the body and upstairs, John, especially culminating with that left hook. Or I'm being honest, he ain't missing much. <laughs> it's been very impressive. And that low calf kick that he keeps on going back well, to. They say anytime you're at 50% or higher in terms of your efficient, you know, efficiency, it's a good night. Well, he's at 64% right now. And Bame missing with the lead left hook. But a very composed, very focused Kai Kamaka. Snatches the leg. High single. There's a nice inside trip. Right to the half butterfly hook of Bame. But now we get to see Kamaka work from the ground, John. And he was a wrestler at the NAIA level, Midland University in Fremont, Nebraska. Yeah, look at it. I don't think anybody in this building is happier than Kevin Bain that he was <laughs> taken down, because at least now he can't be kicked, looking for the arm triangle. Nice job, he's using his left leg, trying to open up that guard, 
Kamaka has Slide one submission through. win. A rear naked choke victory that came in August of 2014. So looking for his first submission win here in Bellator and just his second submission overall. But Bain now from his back, controlling the posture, attacking the body of Kamaka. But Kamaka looking to try to improve his position. John delivers some ground and pound. Bain switching his hips. Well, he's trying to switch his hips. Kamaka is just falling through because Kamaka is just trying to slide that leg up through that half guard. But Bain is starting to take big shots even on the ground here. Under 20 seconds left in the second. And, you know, you're going to see Bain is throwing back. He's actually trying to land strikes, but there's just not the ability to create the power that Kai Kamaka can create from that top position. Strong second round for Kai Kamaka looking to take the back of Bain, but time will run out. Stop. Clean break, guys. Water in your hand. All right, so he's got to come out big, right? Okay, hands on my shoulders. Okay. Here we have Kevin Babe trying to throw that straight jab, trying to keep himself in this fight, but take take a look at Kai Kamaka. It's the big shots that he's been landing, those kick to the liver, the takedown that he ended up using. Look at the kicks to the legs. That's when he catches the leg, goes in for the takedown. Raises that into a single leg, sweeps the leg out. Beautiful job by Kai Kamaka, bringing it to the ground. There's a lot of damage on that open. left leg. And a lot of body speed. You don't like the high pace. Put on that out. left leg. Third and final round in a fight that has been dominated by Kai. Kamaka the third against a game and durable Kevin Bame. Final five minutes and uh, Kevin Bame comes out aggressively knowing he's behind the proverbial eight ball and now on the hunt. This is, this is what I was talking about at the beginning. I said, look, he's tough. There's no quit in him. And I've never seen him ever quit. The best way to beat Kevin Bain is submission because in the stand-up, he just oh, got beautiful it. left hook to the liver. Again, the counter by Kamaka. We've seen all kinds of liver shots. There's another liver kick. And of course, when you think liver kicks, I think of Mirko Krokop, the great Croatian legend. And how about Croatia upsetting Brazil in the World Cup quarterfinals on penalty kicks? I think that's just going to make Juliana Velasquez that much more angrier as she gets ready to rematch Liz Carmouche later tonight as Bame off balance again. Oh, not only off balance, he got hurt a little bit there. Catches that kick momentarily. Nope. Kamak able to reset. Just, you know, take a look at the left leg and look at how he steps with it, Morrow. That's telling you the damage that's on it. He's trying to, he's, he's flat footing it. Trying to keep the balance. And yet, Bain continues to try to march forward, trying to find some way to disrupt the rhythm, the, the tempo, and the attack of Kai Kamaka the third. And now, Kamaka opening up on Kevin Bain with these punches. Kai Kamaka knows. Needs to keep, don't crush your space, keep your distance. Babe desperate to take the fight to the ground. Sprawl by Kamaka, attacking the ribcage with the left. And transitions beautifully to the back and attacking from the back. Wing blocking by Babe. But by Kamaka, now side control. Yeah, but he's not looking towards that submission. He's looking to end this with strikes right now. Hammer fist. A heavy hip ride and just continue to blast shots. Under three minutes left in the fight. Kai Kamaka, the third, looking to bounce back from his first loss in Bellator. He's not, he's not far away from this being it's over. It's over. Yep. And there you go, John. On cue, Kai Kamaka, the third, puts together a terrific performance against a gutsy and game the never say quit Kevin Bain. You know, absolutely, you can take nothing away from Kevin Bain and 
the performance that he had, look, he did everything he could. He took some heavy, big shots throughout that fight. It was just the skill factor and the speed and power of Kai Kamaka just overtook everything. And that low cap kick, Morrow, that was a and, huge. And what about the liver kicks and all oh. the, the left hooks to the liver? Thanks. And the fact that we are now witnessing the first knockout win. Game drops to 0 and 2 here in Bellator and tastes a knockout defeat for the second time in his career. But for Kai Kamaka the third again under the tutelage of Eric Nixick, who will be, of course, in the corner of Rafian Stotts tonight when Stotts, who is also working with MMA veteran Eve Edwards for this camp. He will face Danny Sabatello in the second semifinal of the Bantamweight World Grand Prix, but right now the moment belongs to Kai Kamaka the third, the 27-year-old father of four, wins via knockout for the first time. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, the official time, two minutes, 23 seconds into round number three. Referee Kevin McDonald steps in, waving off the contest due to strikes. The winner by TKO, the Fighting Hawaiian Kai Kamaka. All right, Big John going to be speaking with Kai Kamaka the third. Get over here, you savage. I am here with Kai Kamaka the third. Man, you put on a beautiful performance there. You were opening up with the leg kicks, the calf kick that you hit, the hooks to the body, the kicks to the body. You went up and down that entire fight. Uh, striking. See, thank you to everybody. Thank you to God. Thank you to my family, my wife, my team, my kids. Every win is a big win just because I put everything all my life into it. Every fight, I put everything in me into every fight. I don't take any breaks. Uh, yeah, just glory to God. That makes you four and one inside this cage. You have had a ton of success and you just keep getting better. Is it the fact that you've got coaches like Mr. Cooper there, Mr. Nissick, all these guys that are helping you get better? Yeah, it's the people that I have around me. Uh, my wife, she, um, she's, she's all in. She's been all in since we were 14 years old. And, um, and myself, I, I've seen this since I was a little kid. It's a long road, but I'm not stopping. What is it that you want to do next? Is there anybody that you're looking at you say, that's the person I should be fighting uh, coming up? Uh, I don't know. I, I am, I'm, I'm right there with everybody, right? But I think my career has moved so fast in the past two years. I never took baby steps. I always wanted the big next, uh, the big step. I wanted the, the bonuses. I wanted to be ranked right away. Uh, whatever, whatever. The next, I want to take the small steps, but I'm going to be there. I'm going to be at the top. Well, sit back and be proud. That was a beautiful performance. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Kai Kamaka the third. Ho, ho, ho. Kai Kamaka the third gets his first KO for Christmas. Bellator 289 prelims roll on after this. Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. The new Bellator MMA app is here. New look, new features, new fights. Watch live weigh-ins and prelims. Share your fight picks. Earn points and badges as you rank up to the heavyweight division. And stay up to date on events, 
rankings, and news. For all the latest features, download the new Bellator MMA app. Available on the App Store and Google Play. Ladies and gentlemen, in the semifinal, stop against Sabatello. Congratulations, you won yourself a whooping. There's bad luck in the Bantamweight Grand Prix. This is my friend. Interim champ, Raphael Stotts. We've got a new champion! Faces his nemesis, Danny Sabatello. I came to win. Plus, flyweight champ Lace Carmouche faces former champ Juliana Velasquez in a flyweight title rematch. I cannot wait! Bellator MMA, tonight, live on Showtime. Bellator 289 rolls on here inside the Mohegan Sun Arena, taking a look at the middleweight rankings because that is what is kicking off our night. We have Dalton Rasta going up against Anthony Adams. If you take a look at the rankings, Adams there sitting at 10. Dalton Rasta sitting at 5. Keep in mind, he trains with the champ, Johnny Eblen. They are good friends. Johnny Eblen will be in the house tonight to watch his friend fight Dalton Rasta. Maybe at some point they're going to face off against one another. Look, Anthony Adams, Josh, he had a big layoff. He said it was a very big developmental period for me. Dalton Rasta coming into the fight. He is undefeated. He might have beat your friend. Mr. Cotton, I know you weren't too excited about that. I'm just kidding, though. Uh, what do you see when you look at this fight? I look at Dalton Ross as someone to be reckoned with in this division. The only issue is, though, is that his teammate and one of his main training partners is the champ. And then on top of it, you have Austin Vanderford, who's also his teammate. So they've got they've got a lot to work through, but it's they're, they're not going to get there until the very end. It's for the title if they ever do get to that position, but Dalton Ross is one step away. If he solidifies this win tonight, probably one more fight in that top two or three, and then knocking on the door of Johnny Eblen. Yeah, man, Dalton Rosa, I, I watched a couple of his fights, and he's an explosive athlete. Uh, great wrestling, great boxing. Uh, gets off on that angle where he's uh, got the advantage. He's got the shots, and he's got the, the striking as well. So, man, it's going to be a tough fight. I know Adam's got some striking as well. So, What I noticed in his last fight with Romero Cotton, though, was the swag. He was that, had that swagger about him. It was just he carried it He carried it into the cage. He he had it during the fight, and he let it show. And I'm, I'm expecting another great performance like that tonight. They call him Hercules, and he lives up to that by all means. Anthony Adams, though, his signature line, hold on, because I, I, I can't screw it up because I may say something the wrong way. Bustin' funky dope moves. That is what he plans to do in the cage. Moral, we'll send that back down to you. All right, Amanda, thank you so very much. And we get set for action in the middleweight division, and it will feature Pat Funky Downey. Looking to go 2-0 and as a pro in the Bellator cage against the 2-2, two and two, Christian the Vanilla Gorilla Eccles. And now set to make his way to the cage, the Vanilla Gorilla Christian Eccles. Christian Eccles very physically strong. This guy has got big time power in his hands. He's really good with the submissions. When he grabs hold of you, you have got to know that I've got to suck my arms in, keep my legs from getting caught. The guy's got a good submission game. He's also got a good shiner on that left eye already. 24 years of age. And looking to well make a, make a name for himself here in his first fight in Bellator MMA, but he has a tough test against uh, a guy that has all the makings of a superstar in the sport in in Pat Downey. Look, Pat Downey comes from an incredible wrestling background. You know, you're talking a guy that actually competed for the you know, U.S. team. He is the real deal. The real question is, can he keep his composure and fight smart? We saw in his first fight, it wasn't long. He fought smart. That's what we want to see again tonight. He's going to get the win. Yeah, Eccles says his experience in the cage and his jiu-jitsu will prove to be the demise of Mr. Dell. And now, making his way, Pat Downey. Professional. 
National and Bellator debut in August of this year. And he encourages the boobers. He's, he's a guy who's known to rub people the wrong way. Just ask a USA Wrestling. He's had his issues over the years oh, with, yeah. with his attitude and his personality, but there is no denying his skills, and it's not just in wrestling. His confidence, and, and he said, hey, I'm really enjoying this MMA stuff. I wish I would have started sooner. Well, it took only 36 seconds to record his professional debut win. Uh, right now, you can take a look at that hair. He's going after Rafael Stotts for the title of the best hair in MMA. That's a beautiful Beautiful moment right there, but no, Pat Downey is, he's the real deal, man. He's got an incredible wrestling background. He can always rely on that to get himself safe in a fight if something happens, but he's got the full game now. He's going after submissions. He understands what it takes to transition, and he's going to be a handful for everyone as he goes up the ranks. As simple as it gets, 1-0 and for Pat Downey. Yeah, he's 30 years of age, 2-2 two and two for the 24-year-old Christian Eccles. Here is Michael C. Williams. And now tonight here, the Bellator 289 prelims will go three five-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing first fighting out of the blue corner at five foot ten, weighing in 185.4 pounds. His professional record two and two. He fights out of Coleman, Alabama. Christian, the Vanilla Gorilla. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot two, weighing in 185.8 pounds after a dominant submission victory in his MMA and Bellator debut. He enters tonight at one and oh, fighting out of little Haiti, Miami, full horn of by way of Baltimore, Maryland, presenting Pat Downey. And when the bell your referee in charge, Blake Grice. Pat Downey doesn't think it's going to get out of the first round while his opponent echoes. He predicts a second Aren't round you ready? TKO. Ready, sir? Fight! Bell, round number one. And immediately echoes on the attack. The jab there from Downey, right hand, and... Downey immediately going for the takedown, secures the body lock elevation, and puts Eccles on his back immediately. And that was a that was a beautiful uppercut attempt by Eccles there, but he missed it. Lucky was able to get that takedown. Pat Downey on top position now. We'll see what he can do as far as getting some posture and landing some heavy shots. Downey's quote to us: "These guys can't wrestle with the native ninja." Former NCAA Division I All-American. There's up kicks from Eccles. Downey back on his feet, trying to avoid those up kicks. Now looking to pass the guard and north south a scramble here, John. Did that. He's in a front headlock position for him. Very nice job of shucking his opponent right back to the ground. Now he's going for that roll. Now it's a front headlock position, but this is something Dave Schultz used to do in wrestling to pin guys and it will choke him unconscious. Downey looking very to careful with his second straight submission nice way to begin his professional career. Eccles escapes, lands a knee, also went for that uppercut again, but Downey showcasing his dominant wrestling a little wild in the striking. He's got to settle down a little bit. He spent a lot of energy on that front headlock. Matt Hughes was able to actually choke out Ricardo Almeida with the same thing. So it does work. Echoes moves away from the cage. Calf kick by Echoes. Downey checks that one. Downey, some unorthodox stance here, trying to close the distance. Oh, there's that uppercut again by Eccles. There's a oh, you got to play. Eccles taking the back of Downey, who's been hurt here in the first round. Downey's in trouble right now. He is on wobbly legs. 
Eccles just needs to take his time, place his shots. Eccles looking for his first knockout win. He has got Oh, he's out. Right. And Christian Eccles with the walk-off knockout. Mamma mia! Christian Eccles with the upset win over Pat Downey. Down goes Downey. This is why in MMA, it doesn't matter what background you have, you have got to have the full game. Let's take a look at what happened here. Downey went after him and used a lot of energy, but that left hook right there, that found the mark. Put Downey on his butt. He tried to get himself back up. A little bit on little wobbly legs and then comes back out. That was that shot that put him down the first time. Nice job by Eccles to try to finish him off. Downey was able to get back to his feet, but that uppercut right there, that was on target, right on the button. Boom! Beautiful shot by Eccles, and Downey is out. Well, Christian Eccles predicted a second round TKO. He gets it done here in round number one. Biggest win of his career derails the Pat Downey hype train. Christian Eccles picks up the win and now has won three straight after losing his two first fights. He is on a roll like sushi and he hopes to be a big fish here in bellator mma what a way to make your debut here under the bright lights of bellator meanwhile despondent pat downey tasting defeat early in his career and it could be a very important learning lesson for a world-class wrestler like downey but echo showcasing that he had a lot more to give, but boy, he landed the, the money shot and he has put himself on the map here in his Bellator MMA debut, fighting out of Coleman, Alabama, 10th planet and ironclad, the vanilla gorilla vanquishing Pat Downey in the first round. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. Two minutes, 27 seconds into round number one. The winner by knockout, Christian, the Vanilla Gorilla, Eccles. I want to thank my savior, Jesus Christ. And the winner is going to be talking with BJM. I'm here with your winner, Christian Eccles. Christian, you walked into this cage sporting a black eye already, and he went after you. He had a front headlock, and you kept yourself calm. You got yourself out, and from that point, you started going after some big, heavy shots. Okay, so first of all, it is so awesome to meet you. Well, it's very nice to meet I've you. I've been watching you on TV since I was a kid. That means I'm old. No. I mean, I started at a young age. Like, I was like 13. Point is. So I hit him with a hook or a right hand, and I noticed his wobble. Game plan was no leg kick, so he's a wrestler. So I seen he was rocking, I was like, okay, let's throw one or two. I noticed he didn't like those. Then I hit that big right hand, I thought, oh, it's over. From there, I just pounced. Vanilla Gorilla style, baby. Well, let's talk about the Vanilla Gorilla right uppercut, because that's the one that put him out. When you had him hurt, you crushed your space in the beginning, then you got your space back. And when you landed that shot, did you know, oh yeah, it's over? When I felt that land, I just knew. That's the one, baby. I knew it was there. And uh, you know, I followed up into the fight in impressive fashion, my Bellator debut. Um, is that all your questions for me? I just wanted to say one thing. I got a little girl at home, her name is Mila Bell. I love you, Mila. So right there, she's my whole world, she's my daughter. Daddy's coming home to get you whatever you want, baby. I love it. I love it. Congratulations on a beautiful debut fight.
And I want, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I love you, Jesus Christ, and thank you for bringing me from the life I used to live. He's there, so good. there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for Christian Eccles. Gonna be an extra special Christmas from for the Eccles family. And Amanda, I'm beginning to notice a bit of a holiday theme here when it comes to winners on the prelims. Uh, another holiday theme named Christian Eccles with I the biggest a, win I of his career. I had to put that together, but that is why we have you, Laura Ranella. What a great post-fight interview. Christian Eccles just making a ton of fans there. What, what did he say? What did the, 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 about the gorilla? What did he say? Vanilla gorilla. The vanilla gorilla. And here's the thing. He probably made some people a lot of money in that fight. The half train around Pat Downey just came to a screeching halt for at least a second. React to what we just saw unfold there. Wow. <laughs> I want you guys to know, Josh is like jumping up and down out of his chair watching this fight. What it was was earlier in the round, Pat Downey was chasing that submission, blow himself up a little bit, then came back with, then Echoes came back with some good combinations right after that, making him pay. That little loopy left hook, Bam, sat him down, was able to pounce on him, do a little bit more damage. Then he came in with the right hand. That kind of just pushed him back against the fence. But then this is what I love. See how he took a little step back there so he didn't crowd his space? Landed that go, uppercut. Baby. And this go. is what the sport's all about right here, Pettis. It's just this right here. I promise that's Let's his corner go. and not Josh Yeah, like, which is what it sounded like. Sergio, what did yeah, you think uh, about beautiful it? Beautiful fight, beautiful fight. He faced some adversity. You know, he, uh, other guy came out very strong, trying to get that submission, got that left hook, beautiful uppercut. I thought it was an excellent performance. As a champ now, looking back at someone like that who's starting to burst onto the scene, how excited do you get for a guy like that? Oh, always, always. Excited for anybody that does good in the sport. You know, big knockouts is what everybody's looking for. So to see that and to see it tonight, I haven't been to a military event since I competed and got my knockout. So come here and see this knockout. It's awesome. Maybe we'll see. Go ahead. What was great is at the end, and you said the post-fight interview, was that there's so much that goes through a fighter's mind in a moment like that. He's so excited that he actually spent the time to say to his daughter, to, to everybody that he wanted to believe in, and that's that was awesome. That was so awesome. We love seeing the genuineness yes. from people like that. Sometimes as you move along, you, you can lose that here and there. So congratulations to him hats off absolutely incredible fight incredible finish for christian there uh, and shout out to his baby girl i hope she has a great holiday season as well all right maybe we'll see some knockouts tonight taking a look at the bellator bantamweight world grand prix this is the bracket we started off with eight we are down to four we will see all four of these guys face off tonight but let's look at the guys on the left of your screen there rafian stats going up against danny the italian gangsta sabatello if you have social media if you read anything having to do about the sport of MMA. You have seen these two absolutely going at one another. Stylistically, though, let's get into this. They each only have one loss. Incredible records for both of them. Both of them come from wrestling background. Sergio, you know Rafion. I was listening to Big John this week. He said, Danny may be underestimating the wrestling ability of Rafion Sots. If Rafion gets the win tonight, how's he going to do it? I mean, personally, Rafion just has to shut down the takedowns and not get overwhelmed. You know, um, Danny's going to keep on coming, keep on shooting in. He doesn't get, uh, he doesn't get any type of... Um, you know, like, he, he just doesn't get uncomfortable. He'll just keep on shooting. He'll keep on going. So, Rafion, I think if he utilizes his range, and personally, that left kick, if he throws that left kick, that thing is special. So, tonight, I hopefully, hopefully we can throw that. What you're going to see out of Rafion's thoughts, if he's going to have a successful night tonight, is you're going to see him mix it up. Like you said, the, the head kick, he's going to use that left rear kick, set, set that up against Danny Sabatello, but he's also going to finish that up with some combinations. And to stay away from that back flip at any moment, please, in the fight. I don't want to see that right there. What I want to see, though, is I want to see him let his hands go, his combinations to set up his kicks, and sprawl and brawl. Every time Danny Sabatello shoots a takedown and he doesn't get it, he's got to make Danny pay. I agree, I agree. He's got to make him respect him, you know, so I think obviously hitting him with some big shots, shutting down his game completely. We'll see how Danny deals with that. Rafion absolutely has that power. Let's talk about Danny Sabatello. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you guys saw his Twitter. He said he's been working on some move that has never been seen in MMA before. Maybe we'll see that tonight. I'm not entirely sure. His coach, Mike 
Brown, his coach, some of the best fighters in the world, and he says Danny Sabato's conditioning is not normal. It is so good. Rafion, we can see him get tired somewhere around the third round or so. Is that going to be the biggest advantage that Danny has? When you learn to weaponize your conditioning and your cardio, it just takes you to another level of confidence. And so if he can get this fight into that third, into that fourth round, and really start to wear on Rafion Stotts, if Stotts starts to slow down at all and starts only throwing ones and twos, I think Danny Sabatello is going to start to make it easier to get the takedowns, start easier to start ground and pounding, making transitions to slow the fight down and make Rafion fight from the bottom. I'm very biased, so I'm going to have to disagree with all that. I think it's going to be a rough night for Sobatello, and my boy's going to take that dub. But what you see out of Danny Sabatello is that he's a showman. He's somebody that, when he does get on top, the trash talking is not going to stop. He's going to continue to talk trash on top of stops if he gets them down. And on top of that, he's going to turn to the crowd and try to get a reaction out of them as well, which then, in turn, could start to really make Stotts doubt what he's doing in that cage. For sure. Stotts has definitely got to control his emotions and control the motion of this fight. So if he can do that, I think he's got it personally, but we'll see. Uh, Rafion Stotts, his dad is going to be here for the first time. He has never seen him fight in person, uh, so he'll be excited. His kids are here for the first time to see him fight in person, so a lot riding on his shoulders Is as that well. a little added pressure? I mean, when you're fighting it in front of the whole world that are watching on TV, I don't think it matters personally. I think I think Rafi's gonna come out here and be the champ he is, and doesn't matter who's watching. You are biased. Because he's <laughs> he is a little biased. You are a little biased. <laughs> a little biased. Uh, we are having way too much fun up here. More, we're gonna send it back down to you. All right, the fun continues inside the Bellator MMA cage for the winners anyway, and we are getting set for more action at featherweight. It will be Cody Law who clashes with Chris Lencioni, the final Bellator. MMA event of the year and the prelims roll on Bellator 289 and now to make his way to the cage Chris Sunshine Lencioni Chris Lencioni looking to extend his win streak to three four and two in the Bellator cage with two submissions Nine and three overall with more than half his wins coming via submission. A guy, John, who is known for his good wrestling. We talk about his submission game, very slick, and also a strong will. And it's all about imposing not only your skill, but your will on your book. No doubt about it. Look, Chris Lencioni is a talented fighter. I really enjoy watching him fight. He's tough. He is good everywhere. His submission game is slick. And he just needs to be composed during the fight. He's fighting a good wrestler. He may be on his back, but look out. The submissions are going to be coming. While he's tasted three defeats, he has never been knocked out or submitted. His opponent now to make his way, Cody. The only walk Cody Law has made as a professional fighter has been this ramp to the Bellator MMA cage, and he won his first six fights. Four knockouts and a darts choke on the resume. Things were going extremely well. And then in his last fight, John, he ran into James Gonzalez. He ran into James Gonzalez, and he ran into the situation where he got a little tired. Things didn't work out well for him during parts of that fight, and the, just the pressure of his opponent started to wear down. Look, it was a close fight. It wasn't like he got run over or anything. Very tight fight, but when you allow those moments to happen, and if you show that you're tired, you're telling the judges, uh, I might not be in control of it, and they gave that decision to James Gonzalez. Cody Law needs to come back and reestablish, hey, I'm here, and I am very good. Working hard at American Top Team to correct what went wrong in that fight, looking to end the year with a bounce-back victory. Our tail of the tape of this fight. Take a look. It's actually pretty close along everything. Just a 68.5 reach for Cody Law. A little bit longer at 71 inches for Chris Sunshine Lencioni. With the introductions, here is Michael C. Williams. Here at Mohegan Sun Arena for tonight. Bellator 289 prelims will go. Three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. 
Introducing the blue corner at five foot ten, weighing in 146 pounds even. His professional record, nine wins, three losses. He fights out of Camby, Oregon, Chris Sunshine Lecioni. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145.4 pounds as a professional. Near perfect, six victories, just one defeat. He fights out of Coconut Creek, Florida, by way of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, presenting Cody Maul. In charge, your referee, Blake Rice. Cody, you ready? Chris, you ready? Fight. Well, round number one in the Bellator 145-pound division. Lazioni taking the center of the cage, putting pressure on Law. Law utilizing some footwork, trying to set up a trajectory. Calf kick lands for Lazioni. The calf kick is something Chris Lazioni really needs to utilize and stick with it during this fight. That'll slow down Cody Law in his stand-up, and if he goes into deciding I'm gonna shoot, it's gonna slow it down. For Lencioni, all five of his wins via submission have come in the first round for the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt, but of course, every fight begins in the stand-up, and they continue to chop away with those low kicks. Nice footwork there by Law, throws the right hand. And again, it's Law intercepting Lencioni with that right over the top of Lencioni's jab. Yeah, Lenc Lencioni's doing a little bit too much talking and not enough fighting right now. He's showboat, he's putting pressure, but he's not really throwing shots. Lencioni fighting out of the warrior camp. Training partner includes UFC lightweight Terrence McKinney. There's a nice lead left hook, curls behind the guard of Lencioni. Lencioni trying to sell it as if it didn't bother him, trying to establish the jab, but it's Law who's just sticking to the game plan and not allowing Lencioni's mind games to bother him thus far. And it, it, it is not an easy thing to do when you're not used to guys talking to you this way. It can definitely disrupt your mentality in the fight. So Cody Law just needs to keep up with what he's doing. Lenciani just does this, and he, he is not an easy person to fight. I've said that many times. His stand-up is awkward. It's unusual. His ground game is dangerous, so he'll take shots. No one has gotten rid of him so far in his career. Fainting from Law switches stances, head kick blocked, and then another kick, so right and left kick spinning, back fist attempt by Lencioni, and the histrionics of Lencioni continue as we reach the midway point of the first round. Trying to get Lencioni to bite on his feints, John. He's trying, but it's not working because Lencioni is basically with his hands down. Take a look, he keeps on putting his left hand behind his hip. And again, if the very one of the very best to do it can get caught showboating, and I'm talking about Anderson Silva, you best believe a guy like Lencioni can get caught. Oh, there's no doubt. You are taking a chance, especially when a guy's got good hands like Cody Law. Cody throws straight shots. He's got good balance on his. Uh, nice stand up from and Lencioni. good power. Yeah, now it's oh, Lencioni catches with the left, but then Law comes back with the right. Calf kick by Law. And again, Lencioni just walking forward, hands down, defying Cody Law and lands the left. Law got with the oh, and then Law gets uh, caught momentarily. To watch his neck. For the choke. He's to watch his neck right now. And this is what happens when you fight somebody that is different get everybody else it can get in your head you've got to slow down don't let him start to control you in the fight you've got to do what you do best and one of the things that Cody Law does best is wrestle so take him to the ground slow him down he's still gonna talk 
but you're in the position to do the damage. Cody Law attended and wrestled for Penn State University and then University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown, where he won his NCAA Division II championship. Was a two-time D2 All-American, so well-versed on the ground. But Lencioni very active from his back. Yeah, right now, Lencioni's the one that's landing. Thrown into a figure four. It's like, why? I have no idea. But from this position, we've talked about that before, the body triangle when you're on the bottom. Well, yeah, and it's okay. If you get hurt, if you get hurt in right. the fight, it's okay. Exactly. You know, gain some time to get yourself back. But when you're not hurt, well, he's trying to hurt Law, though, with these elbows from the bottom. Yeah. Only guy I ever thought had power from his back was, remember, you were Shima Hansen, the Viking? Oh, well, he, pride he, from, he was just... That was from all the cigarettes nasty. he smoked. Yeah. <laughs> nice elbow by Cody Law there. So a good start for Cody Law. A lot of gamesmanship from Chris Lencioni. Ten, stop. Easy, easy, easy. Yep. It was close. We can't count. I think so, but we, we can't count on that. We, we, got, we got wobble. That's why. You took him down. But hey, you're good on top. You can, you, you can stifle him all day. We, we can shut him down on top. So, so take your time. Yeah, take your time. Here's Lencioni with a nice jab. That hook lands clean. You see Cody Law trying to get the counters in there. None of them landing, really. Cody Law right there. Left hook. Touches him a little bit. No power really on it. It's just the style of Lencioni that is causing Cody Law to have problems. All the trash talk, everything that's going on, it's a little bit different. He needs to settle down and just fight. Mohegan Sun Arena, the 46th Pelator event held in this venue. Are we getting mail here for Bellator MMA yet? Home team. Second round gets underway, and we uh, saw Mike Brown in Cody Law's corner. Mike Brown, a former featherweight champion of the WEC, and with each and every outing by an ATT fighter, his reputation as one of the top trainers in the sport continues to grow. Oh, no doubt about it. Mike Brown is absolutely one of the top guys out there. Oh. A student of the game, a guy that watches every, every fighter, watches tape continuously, and is always trying to improve what he can do. And he's one of the biggest reasons that Danny Sabatello is so confident about his Opportunity. Speaking of Sabatello, Law securing the takedown on Lencioni, but Sabatello, of course, will face Rafion Stotts, main event coming up later tonight in the Bantamweight World Grand Prix. Lencioni looking for a submission. Lencioni looking for that triangle, and he's close to setting that up right now. Lencioni has five of his nine wins via tap out. It's the arm that he can go after because he's losing right there. He does not have the triangle set. Nice job by Cody Law, staying nice and composed. Law has never been finished again, just Back. suffered his first loss against James Gonzalez for a unanimous decision, but Lencioni continues to work from his back. And he does have two triangle choke wins on his ledger. Well, he's giving Cody Law problems by shooting up these submission attempts because what he's doing is he's making Cody Law defend. That's taking all the offense away from being in the top position is great, but if you got no offense, you're losing. Lencioni, one thing he told us made clear, he's always looking for the finish, and here on his back, he's definitely trying to do that, shooting up those submissions, but now Law with the wide base into the guard now. Lencioni trying to lock down Cody Law here with three minutes left in the second. Well, based upon what occurred in the first round, if you're looking at it, Lencioni was causing problems for Cody Law in the stand-up. He was awkward for him. He had Cody Law off balance with a lot of his stand-up, but when it got to the ground, Cody was more able to control what Chris was doing. Well, that's what he's and going after. Law goes into round. side control. And while Lencioni leads in total strikes, landed 46 to 33, including 11 to four here in round two. It's Laws wrestling two for three, and now from this position, Lencioni still looking. He's got a backside triangle now. He let go of it. 
But Dynamic offense from his back. You take a look at everything that's happening. There's a couple good strikes from Cody Law, but for the most part, all of these submission attempts and everything he's throwing up is keeping Cody Law from being able to have much offense. Mazzoni started wrestling at the age of 14, wrestled in high school. We talked about the fact that he is a BJJ brown belt and has definitely been working from his back, trying to find a submission. Meanwhile, Law has been unable to really do much from top position except try to defend submissions. That's exactly it. You take a look at what's happening. Cody Law is controlling position, but he's not doing anything offensively to damage Chris Lencioni while Lencioni's throwing these little elbows. Now we're getting some offense there. Cody Law's really got to up that. Continue Ratchet up the shots. offense, the ground and pound, but it's now Lencioni controlling the posture. Just over a minute left in the middle frame. Watch the spine with that heel. Referee warning Lencioni to watch the spine with these heel strikes. Under a minute left in the round. So everything you're seeing with Lencioni keeps on moving the position. Now as right he stays in one law. position, Law is able to open up. 30 seconds left in the round. Cody Law in top position, but Chris Lencioni, despite spending a long time on his back, has been the one who's initiated the attack, John, going for submission, throwing strikes. Over interesting to see how the judges will score the round. It will be very interesting because there was a lot of strikes from Lencioni. There were some heavy strikes at times from Cody Law, just not very many of them. Submissions. Okay. Don't sit with stick with one submission, okay? Okay, breathe. Breathe your nose, breathe on your mouth. Breathe your nose, breathe on your mouth. One more. Okay, stay low, because he, he's just gonna shoot again. He's gonna shoot again. You're working with your jab. Fall with the two. I'm telling you, I promise you, you land that two, he's gonna fall on his okay. butt. You already made him fall on his butt in the first round. Yeah. Make him fall on his butt in the second, third round. Yeah. Okay, let's do this. Second out, let's go, boys. Third and final round, and John, uh, first uh, your unofficial scorecard, and then I want you to quickly comment on what you heard in each corner. You know, unofficially, I have this even. I have it 1-1, one, one because you take a look at what happened the first. Cody getting that takedown was not enough ticket. He got the second one, even though it was close. And he needs to do more, but I thought Mike Brown did a very good job of telling Cody Law what he needed to do. And what about Lencioni's corner telling him to, you know, ensure that uh, you watch for that takedown because Law's going to shoot. There's no doubt he's going to shoot. Look at where he was more successful in the in this fight. It was when he took that and went for that shot, got him to the ground early. In the stand-up in that first round, he did not do well. The gamesmanship continues for Chris Lezioni. Meanwhile, four and a half minutes remain in the fight, and he did spend a large portion of that middle frame on his back, and we talked about it, John, depending on what the judges see, but you did a good job of uh, breaking it down, and there's a jab from Lezioni. The level changed by Law, searching for the takedown, defended by Lezioni. And then when you get to this point right here, you see Lezioni looking for 100% trying to get that arm. This is when you have someone that's as good a wrestler as Cody Law, and he can control where the fight ends up, and it's a huge advantage. Now Law says he's comfortable wherever the fight goes, but he is now in a position to try again to take advantage of top position on a guy who is very active from his back in Chris Lencioni, very comfortable. And yet time is ticking away and he should not accept this position by any means, nor have we seen him do that. Law 
you're telling us that Lencioni, the tallest fighter he's ever faced as a professional, he expects to make him quit. He has just over three minutes in order to make that prediction come to fruition. Oh, there was never, when he, that's a nice statement, but no one has ever made, made him quit. quit. So and I didn't see that happening. The crowd would like to see someone try to make the other quit. Lenciano needs to start a little bit of desperation here. You cannot sit on your back if you're going to win this fight. Get those feet on the hips, start to take away the hands of Cody Law so you can push off, get some space, get yourself back to your feet. Because if you stay here, probably not going to go your way. He's looking for a Kimura. Narsup momentarily taking the back. Puts the hook in. But that's that's but not a bad Lenz move by Lencioni. Morrow, that's that's a good. He's got to get out. Yeah, especially that uh, area right there. You're right, where he now finds Law with his back to the fence and rolls. Just past the midway point of the final round scramble. Lencioni up to his feet, looking for a standing switch, perhaps that double wrist lock. Kimura dead well defended right now by Law. Law looking for the ankle pick, taking Lencioni down. But Lencioni like a dog on a bone. Yeah, they lost the grip on that arm, and he's too high yeah, on the back right now. Escape, potentially here for Law. You're going to see Law come out the back door, no doubt about it. If you're Lencioni, you're looking towards a triangle, trying to hook up a triangle, but his legs right now are not in the position to do it. But now, if you're Cody Law, you cannot sit here in this position and think that you're going to take this fight. You have got to get out. You see Lencioni trying to stretch that arm out. He's trying to put some pressure down on that arm. If you're Cody Law, you got to move. You got to start to try to change this up. His head is stuck. Stops it out. out. And into side control. And now, well, good job by Lencioni recovering. And there's hammer fist from the bottom by Lencioni who has two rear naked chokes, two triangle chokes, and an arm bar on his resume, and again continues fishing for submissions while Cody Law, from top position, John, unable to get much done. And, and you can see that Chris has taken what we could say off angle Cody Law here, but he doesn't have the control of the arm that he would need to have to get that arm bar, and right now, using that figure four on his body, All right, guys, if you want he's to not doing there, anything. Work, Referee wanting a little, little more action. In the words of Elvis, a little more action, a little less conversation from Lencioni. 30 seconds now left in the fight. Now, again, we mentioned what Law's doing. What do you make of Cody Law here controlling the, the position? Controlling, but he's not being able to be real offensive, I and mean, that's what I said was the problem. He hasn't landed a whole lot of good strikes on Lencioni. He has thrown some, but look to see what lands. There haven't been many. It will be interesting to see how the judges adjudicated uh, for law three of five in the takedown department. Lencioni with the edge in total strikes landed 63 to 48. John, how, again, <laughs> what you know, you're the guy who wrote the rules. You've been a part of this sport since day one. How do you see this fight, or how sh do you see it uh, being adjudicated, and how should it be adjudicated? I think it's going to be, be the I think it's going to be adjudicated right, for Cody right. Law. I think Cody's going to end up based upon he was the one that put the fight where he wanted it to be. You take a look at the striking in the first round. You got to give it to Chris Lencioni. That was the majority of it. That's why I gave him that round. But then from the second into the third, I think Cody Law did what he wanted to do. He made it a grappling match. And Lencioni had his moments, but not enough, in my opinion, that they're going to give it to him. I think it's Cody Law. That's what, once? Cody Law looking to rebound from his first professional defeat. Big John McCarthy thinks he's done enough on his unofficial scorecard. Meanwhile, Chris Lencioni 
wants to keep his winning streak alive and he's pretty confident he's pretty happy and then John I mean from his position he was doing what you want to see a guy on his back do absolutely I have no problem if the judges go and say oh, we're giving Chris Lencioni based upon he was the guy that was actively attempting to finish the fight and, and I agree with that I'm just thinking that they looked and said Cody Law was in the opposition. I think that was the direction that they're going to go. I love the fact that Prince Lesione is trying to finish the fight. He's not looking to control. He's looking to finish. That's what we want to see. I still won. I still won. <laughs> Smart Alec. But hey, Chris Lencioni says he is an entertainment capitalist. He's thinking all the time inside the cage and well talking a lot of the time too. He says he microprocesses everything. He says there's a giant supercomputer in his head. A Chris giant yep. supercomputer. Well, and if you don't use it, I he thought, says that's dumb. Yeah, but isn't it better to have the smaller computer than oh. it is the supercomputer? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well. Michael C. Williams has the name of the victor. Let's go to him now. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance now, we'll go to your three judges. Your first, Dave Bruce scores at 30 to 27. He sees the fight for Lencioni. Your second judge at K-side, Eric Colon, 29 to 28. He scores the fight for Law. Your third and final judge at cage side, Brian Miner, scores at 30 to 27. Seeing it for the winner by split decision, Chris Sunshine Lencioni. Well, it's a po unpopular decision, John. The judges giving Lencioni the credit that you thought he deserved for trying to finish the fight from his back. This is what we want from our fighters. We two want the judges them, anyway. Well, two the judges. We want them attempting to finish the fight. We do not want them trying to just control and let the time run by. And that's what the judges were seeing. Three consecutive wins now for Chris Lencioni as he returns to Bellator MMA and proves to five and two in the Bellator cage. We'll continue with more Prelim action as the Chris Lencioni show continues inside the uh, cage, much to the chagrin of the crowd here at Mohegan Sun Arena. I'm loving it. Streets Bellator fans head to bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. Ladies and gentlemen, in the semifinal stop against Sabatello. Congratulations, you won yourself a whooping. There's bad luck in the Bentonwood Grand Prix. This is my right. Interim champ, Raphael Stotts. We've got a new champion! Faces his nemesis, Danny Sabatello. I came here to win. Plus, flyweight champ Lace Carmouche faces former champ Juliana Velasquez in a flyweight title rematch. I cannot wait! Bellator MMA, tonight, live on Showtime. Things are getting exciting here at Bellator 289, going down inside the Mohegan Sun Arena. We have two belts on the line tonight. We also have the semis of the Bellator Bantamway World Grand Prix, the final four who will punch their ticket to the final and get a shot at a million dollars. We want to show you, though, these middleweight rankings. We have two guys going up against one another tonight. Number five, you see him there, Dalton Rosta. Number 10, Anthony Adams. They will be kicking off our main card tonight. But you see the champ. Mr. Johnny Eblen got the belt on his shoulders, and Johnny Eblen decided to leave the warm weather of South Florida, come up here to Connecticut. We stole him out of the crowd, joining us here on the fight desk, because we have so much to talk to you. First of all, you're here representing so many guys from ATT. Yeah. I mean, they're all over this card tonight. Yeah, we got Mike Lombardo. He just fought. He got a good knockout. Um, 
We got Cody Law, he just fought, he just got a loss. Um, it was kind of tough to watch. We got Dalton Rasta coming up. He's a good buddy of mine. We train a lot together. Um, really hyped to see that fight. And then we have Danny Sabatello, uh, the, the Italian gangster. He likes to talk a lot of crap. And uh, man, I really like the, uh, the character he's playing. I'm, I'm really buying into it and I really like him, man. He's uh, he's really promoting himself. And We're going to awesome. get to that one in a second. Let's talk about Dalton Rasta first because he's kicking off the card. Look, he is still undefeated. He is going up against a guy who's had a pretty long layoff. You've trained with him very closely. You said, I actually trained with him more so than almost anyone. What do we need to know about him going into this fight? Man, that kid has confidence like crazy. He could go through a tough-ass camp, things aren't going his way, but fight night, he shows up and he fights really, really well. This man has the boxing, he has the grappling, he has the wrestling, he has it all. He just needs more fight experience and he just needs to keep doing what he's doing. Well, first off, did you even own a hoodie when you come from Florida? Like, <laughs> Honestly, I forgot to pack a jacket. Yeah. So that's the only reason. I'm about to go to uh, ATL after this and then go to North Carolina with my girlfriend and uh, a few other friends go to this vineyard. But you, anyway, it's like... Ooh, so fancy kinda. for you. So yeah, fancy. So fancy now. <laughs> you dug that thing out of the back of the closet. I did. I did. <laughs> Dalton Ross, explosive, good wrestler, yeah. phenomenal wrestler. Yeah. Got great boxing, yeah. confidence. But I was talking with Amanda earlier and I said the confidence was so key. He came in with such swagger against Romero Cotton. And he looks to carry that over tonight. How do you see this fight tonight going? Man, I think he's fighting a little bit better of a striker. Um, I think he just needs to mix up his wrestling, take his time, and, and continue to strike with the guy. Uh, the guy he's fighting tonight is a, is a good competitor. Um, as long as he mixes it up and takes his time, I think he's going to knock him out, to be honest. That motherfucker has power. Excuse my language. I don't know if you can cuss on here. It's all right. We're not, we're not <laughs> quite on TV yet. My first time. <laughs> it's all right. This is like your audition. You're doing really well. We'll have you back. We like having champs on the yeah. desk here. You talked about Danny Sabatello. Everybody's talking about this fight, the main event tonight, going up against Rafael Sats. You see him every day yeah. in the gym. So we're really curious. We got to talk to Mike Brown. We just saw him over there in Cor Cody Law's corner. And he said Danny Sabatello has better conditioning than almost anyone I've ever seen seen look at your eyes they got really big is that true that is a true statement I mean I have a good gas tank and when Colby Covington was at the at, at ATT that dude had a good gas tank I, I mean he's up there with me um, and Colby when he was at the gym and uh, we're known for our gas tanks and Danny has a damn good gas tank and he'll let you know too he'll yeah you he'll let it. you know and he'll talk about it while and he'll tell you fuck you to your face as he's letting you know <laughs> Does he do that at, 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 like when he's training? That, that is Danny Sabatello. All the time. That's All Danny the time. Sabatello. And everybody that knows him from when he wrestled at Purdue, that's Danny Sabatello. So it's not a stick then. This it's is the real Danny Sabatello, yeah. what you're getting. Yeah. So it's he's, not made up. He's being true to himself, just more, you know, in your face. Because, you know, it sells. And but that's it's not fake. He's that is him. And I'm glad he's found like the character he needs to play and it's not fake. So leave us with this, and my last question is, how do you see this fight panning out? Man, it's going to be a tough fight. Um, I think Rafion might, might level out the wrestling to where we're going to see more of Danny striking. Danny actually has really good striking. He hasn't shown it too much in the, uh, well, in the cage yet. So maybe tonight we'll see it. If it's not broke, don't fix it, man. That's true. That's true. But if someone forces you to strike with them, you gotta, you gotta do it. I'm gonna throw one more at you because you actually know Rafion Stotts as well. Yes. Where do you think he could potentially have the advantage tonight? I think he would have the advantage maybe on the feet, but I've seen Danny in the training room. That dude has hands. He just hasn't shown it to the crowd yet. Not yet. He said we're going to see some stuff from him maybe we haven't seen before. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, thank you so much. I know potentially you and Dalton Rossa could eventually meet down the line. Not really sure. You guys are buds. Cannot wait to see your journey. We've been packed and blessed with nothing but champs tonight. I know. Nice. Where's your belt, Josh? You got those at home? Oh, come on. <laughs> I am just kidding. All right. We have an incredible main card coming up tonight here at Bellator 289, including this one right here, a rematch, the women's flyweight world championship that belt right now on the shoulder of Liz Carmouche but Juliana Velasquez says the referee gifted her that belt and she wants it back you know there are a lot of statements that have been made in my career and it seems like I'm always that person that's that's brought in and you have these undefeated up-and-comers whether they're champions whatever organization and I'm supposed to be the welcoming mat as they progress further on their career, and I stop them dead in their tracks. And Juliana Velasquez is that same thing. 
On April 22nd, 2022, I had the opportunity to fight for the belt for Bellator in front of military troops and to do it in this beautiful arena in Hawaii. The Bellator MMA Flyweight Championship. Oh, oh wow! Damn by Julia. And dropping Carmouche! Yeah, Velasquez has become the sniper here. She's just setting up that left hand. Carmouche has tasted the power, now looking for the takedown. As we go to round number four. Coming into Bellator, I want to finish every fight. I didn't want to be that person that goes to decisions. I need to take that belt and to make sure it's mine. And so going to that fourth round, I knew I'm like, we can't go to decision. It has to end now. And I could feel her start to wane and start to get weak. And when I had her on the cage, I just knew I'm like, this is the moment. And now looking to deliver some ground and pound. Crucifix position, short elbow strikes. I pictured everything. I knew where I was going to. I knew the finishing point was right there. Referee stops the fight. We've got a new flyweight champion. No doubts, no decisions, no questions in anybody's mind. Not too sure about that stoppage, Moro. I don't think she was eating any heavy shots. I don't think she was in trouble. No, no, estava em perigo em momento algum. Não, na luta inteira eu não me machuquei em nada. Após a luta eu até tirei a foto do meu rosto como é que estava. I can see the controversy just in the sense that she wasn't bleeding. That's the only controversy that can possibly come because anybody looks at her body language. When they see her not climbing up the cage, not moving her arms, not moving her legs, not doing anything except taking abuse, how long are you supposed to let that go on? As the ref's job is to protect the fighters, and the fighters is our responsibility as professionals to protect ourselves. So when they stop doing it, it's the responsibility of the ref to step in. There's no doubts or question in my mind about that. Eu não penso muito sobre essa derrota, até porque na minha cabeça não houve derrota. Eu ganhei a luta, isso foi claro, mas passado, o que é passado, passado. Está morto, está enterrado e eu não gosto de levantar o que, é, o que já está morto. I think this fight is definitely better than the last fight, because in the last fight, she overlooked me. Why it's not the fight that I wanted to be my first title defense, I want to shut her up. Ixi, a gente sabe que você está com o meu cinturão, agora eu vou buscar ele de volta. Eu vou dominar essa luta e nenhum árbitro vai te ajudar. Eu sei que eu estava vencendo aquela luta e ela sabe que eu estava vencendo aquela luta. Dessa vez eu vou dominar eles com Agora me dá a porra do meu cinturão de volta. When I said I want to come out, I want to come out violently and make sure that she doesn't open up her mouth again. That's exactly what I intend to do. I want to smash her face in. Both of those women told us this week this fight means twice as much as the first one. And Juliana Velasquez says that first Juliana you saw in the first fight, the patient one, she is dead. She is going to come out aggressive. We cannot wait to watch it. Mora, we'll send it back down to you to continue the prelims. All right, AG, thank you so very much. Two fighters going in opposite directions in the Bellator MMA promotion. Kyle Crutchmer has won three in a row. Jaleel Willis has lost two straight, both via submission who will prevail in our upcoming welterweight battle Jaleel Willis, a promising start to his MMA career. John comes in now, age 30, 15 wins, four losses, five knockout wins, 3-2 here in Bellator, but he has tasted defeat against Saba Homasi and Mukhamed Burkamov and has been submitted in both of those fights and now facing a guy, as I just mentioned, riding a wave of momentum uh, mentally. Where does Willis have to be for a fight like tonight? Well, especially in this fight, he's got to be in that, that mindset that, hey, if I get taken down, which he's got good wrestling, but he's facing a supreme wrestler in Kyle Crutchford. If I get taken down, I need to work my way back to my feet as soon as possible without giving up a good position. He has made mistakes that have led to his downfall in getting submitted by two guys that caught him. You make those mistakes, you got to learn from those mistakes and show us now, hey, that's not going to happen again. And Willis, uh, the first to respect Crutchmer's wrestling skills, but he feels that uh, he can outlast Crutchmer. He feels that Crutchmer's uh, conditioning well, may be an issue, but... Let's be honest, his stand-up 
Julio Willis is slick at the stand-up, and he's got good wrestling, like I said. It's just that now there's that blueprint on him that people are going to try to exploit, put him on his back, and he's got to be the guy that makes that, that in. And now to make his way, Kyle Crutchman. 29-year-old Kyle Crutchman, we've talked about his wrestling background, two-time NCAA Division I All-American and Big 12 champion at Oklahoma State under the legendary John Smith, the only American wrestler ever to win six consecutive World or Olympic Championships as a competitor. And John Smith, I mean, when you are under his learning tree, you know a thing or two about wrestling, but this is mixed martial arts, and Kyle Crutchman coming off a victory over Michael Lombardi we saw score a big knockout win earlier tonight, but here's a guy who's gone the distance in his last three fights and is, is looking to turn things up a notch here tonight, even though obviously things are going well. You know, he is looking to turn it up, and I've been so impressed with the progression of Kyle Crutchburg and his fight against Lombardo. Look, he used his hands to get into those takedown situations. He took a dangerous guy and made it to where he took him out of that danger zone by putting his hands on him at time, and then when he thought he was going to be in the stand, up fight. Kyle took him, picked him up, and dropped him down onto the mat with his wrestling skill. Kyle Crutchmer is getting better and better. And look, the future looks bright. Yeah, and speaking of futures being bright, one of the brightest MMA stars, Daniel Cormier, also at Oklahoma State. In fact, instrumental in getting Kyle Crutchmer to go to San Jose, California at AKA. So here we go. Welterweight matchup between Kyle Crutchmer and Jaleel Willis. Crutchmer currently ranked at number eight. And look at that. There's a huge difference at 74.5 as far as that reach for Jaleel Willis. Only 68 for Kyle Crutchmer. But if you're Crutchmer, you just want to get into those wrestling maneuvers. Let's get into the official announcement. Here is Mr. Michael C. Williams. For all those with us tonight throughout the UK, live on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you here to Mohegan Sun as we get set now at the prelims to go. Three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. First, introducing the blue corner at 5'11", weighing in 170 pounds, even as a professional. 15 wins, four defeats from North Memphis, Tennessee. He fights out of Miami, Fulhorn. Jaleel, the real has Willis. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at 5'9", weighing in 170.8 pounds, ranked now at number eight. He enters with nine professional victories, just a single defeat. He fights out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, introducing Kaiho. And the referee in charge, Dan Mergliata. The argument can be made that Kyle Crutchmer should be a perfect 10-0. Many observers thought he should have been given the decision in his lone loss to Cameron Lachimov. Jaleel Willis, all five knockout wins have come in the first round. Nine of his last right. ten victories yes, have ready, come go, by Joe. decision. Bell, round one, and we are underway. They touch gloves, and... Willis immediately fainting. Jab from Willis. There's a jab from Crutchman. Look to change levels. There's a one-two from Willis that lands. John, you talk about his his striking and how he's been able in the past as well, utilizing his feet, playing an effective counter game, and there lands the calf kick. Jaleel Willis has got very good stand-up. His boxing, he's not much of a kick boxer, really. He will throw kicks, but his setup for his hands, he does a beautiful job of moving his feet, getting himself into range, landing beautiful combinations. And I would think that his jab should be on point tonight. He needs to go to that jab and go to it often to keep Crutchmer at a distance where
where Crutchmer doesn't feel comfortable coming in for that takedown. Crutchmer's had some success with the jab early as well, but Willis really sitting down on that right hand. He predicts the knockout. He feels that his preparation has never been better working with Kill Cliff FC down in Miami, Florida. Jab to the body by Willis. Crutchmer showing his dexterity. That was a really nice high kick over the head of Julia Willis. Willis switches stances to Southpaw. Crutchmer, guiding hand on that jab again, gets through, and Willis follows up the right. And, and Willis really needs to, the three punch combination of throwing that jab down the middle. Now throw it, throw it, and then throw that right hand and bring that hook up because Kyle's dipping his head and he's dipping it right into where that hook will be. Action in the Bellator welterweight division. Good to see the reigning champion Yaroslav Amasov back front kick by Willis to the body. Amasov will defend against Logan Storley February 25th next year in Dublin, Ireland. Boy, I can't wait for that fight. I can't wait to, to see Amazon Dublin, fight. Ireland finally. <laughs> no, nice right hand over the top by Willis Lands. And you see Crutchmer's reaching out. Oh, good one throwing his hands. He's got to stop with the reach out. He doesn't have the length. If you are the longer fighter, you can do that. If you're not, it's not a good thing for you to start getting into. And Crutchmer's actions indicate that he's uh, seen enough of Willis' striking, tries to go for the takedown, but Willis defending it along the fence. And again, we talk about Crutchmer and his wrestling accolades. But this is mixed martial arts. Yeah, it's a completely different world, especially when you get into this clinch up against the cage. Jaleel Willis can use that cage as a balance point, and this is not an easy thing for Kyle Crutchmer to get into the legs or get into the body lock. Willis able to move away from the fence momentarily. Crutchmer trying to push him back, and again, a lot of energy being expended here. Crutchmer with the knee up the middle. Jaleel needs to dig that underhook just a little bit more. Crutchmer's keeping him from doing it. But if he can get that underhook deeper, he's going to be able to elevate that side of the body and turn Crutchmer. Under 90 seconds left in the first. Referee Mergliana separates them. And they will resume action in the center of the cage, much to the delight of a very educated and passionate Bellator MMA fan base here at Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut. Much to the delight of Jaleel Willis. <laughs> A minute now remaining in the opening round. Jab from Crutchford. Oh, beautiful combination. Follow up with the body kick, then crushes the space. Crutchford 0 for 1 in the takedown department. Now they're right now being credited with equal number of strikes landed, and yet Willis has had the better, more eye-catching shots. Absolutely, he's had way more power on his shots. Crutchford's landed a couple good things, but overall, Willis has had the decided advantage. And Willis now stalking Crutchmer, pins him along the fence. That was a mistake. See how he crushed that space so much? You had him hurt, you had him a little bit in trouble. Don't crush your space. Or you crush your hopes. <laughs> there you go. Ten seconds left here in the opening round, and things just beginning to warm up here between Crutchmer and Willis. Great. Good job, gentlemen. Good job. Here's a replay. Nice left oh. hook, short, sweet. That stunned Kyle Crutchmer. You can see he did not like it. Then the kick comes in. But again, Willis getting into that grappling situation. Beautiful left hook. Right hand miss, going glancing on the shoulder, but the kick was nice, had an impact. Those are the type of shots that are gonna, should win Jaleel Willis that round. A lot of great training for Jaleel Willis at Kill Cliff FC with the likes of Gilbert Burns, Yo, jab, jab. Kevin Lee, yeah. look, look, jab, jab, right. and trainer Let's Greg go. Jones. And of course, for Crutchmer, we talk about his association with AKA. Been working with the likes of newly minted Bellator lightweight champion Usman Nurmagomedov. 
What a performance by Nurmagomedov to oh. dethrone Patriki Pitbull. Boy, he looks so good. Calf kick by Crushmer to begin the proceedings in the second round. Jab from Willis. That first round had to give Jaleel Willis a lot of confidence. And how did you uh, score it? Well, I guess your words speak for themselves, but 10-9 uh, so, Willis, why? 10-9 Willis, look, he landed the better shots. He actually hurt Crutchmer in that, stunned him a little bit. He, he was a guy that, he was leading the dance for the most part. Crutchmer, when he had the clinch, wasn't able to do anything up against the cage. That should go 10-9 Jaleel Willis. Crutchmer has to keep his head off the center line as he eats that one-two. Doing a good job of diversifying his attack, John, going to the body before going upstairs. I watch, notice the difference in the footwork. Marl Willis is on his toes, he's moving. Crutchmer's getting a little flat footed because he's not oh. sure exactly where the shots are going to come from. He's got to start moving his feet a little more. And Crutchmer trying to parry the shot, but again, eats the right hand from Willis. Double jab by Willis, follows up with the right that misses. And Willis but should be, he should be putting into that computer. Look, every time I'm throwing that right hand, he's turning his head to the left to try to roll with it. Let me come back with a left hook. Rushmer's corner, implying, imploring him to get that right arm loose, but good job by Willis to neutralize it. And in this clinch, well, you guys want to stay, you gotta work, you gotta work. Referee Mergliata wants them to work. And, uh, timing. And, and, and that's, you know, Crutchmer, he's trying, he's trying to figure out, let me figure out where I need to go so I can get this takedown. Body kick from Willis, again, Crutchmer comes in ranked number eight. Willis looking to knock him from that ranking. Beautiful right uppercut followed by another right behind it, John. Yeah, you, don't, you don't see a lead right uppercut very often. Now from a southpaw stance, Willis fainting again, looking to bring the attack to Crutchmer. Crutchmer taking a deep breath and eats a couple of shots to the body. Of course, looking to deplete that tank. And again, touches him to the body, immediately goes over top with the right hand. A striking clinic from Willis. Willis going up and down to the body, back to the head. Now he's got Kyle really unsure of where everything's gonna come from. Crutchmer's won three in a row. Willis looking to snap a two-fight losing streak, and there's Crutchmer looking for the takedown. Wide base by Willis. Wide base by Willis, but Crutchmer's strong, and he can wrestle, man. All he needs to do is suck that up just a little bit, get his hands together. If Kyle gets those hands together, Willis is gonna go for a ride. We've talked about the strong wrestling skills of Willis, both offensively and defensively, and while we would never compare his credentials to Crutchmer, here in this cage, doing a good job tonight, John. You're so right, Marl, because it's, there's so many other elements. Crutchmer can't do all the things. Left uppercut, right hook, Johnny. Good to be done. And again, stuffing the takedown of, of a much more desperate Crutchmer. Well, and that's the real difference. You're starting to see Kyle Crutchmer really start He's shooting for this fast now because he's having problems. He's getting a little bit desperate. He's got that foot up in the air. See if he can turn the corner. Can't do it. Jaleel Willis doing a nice job of fighting off all of these takedown attempts so far. Final minute of the second round, and Crutchmer with dogged determination trying to take Willis off his feet. And thus far, Willis has defended all five of Crutchmer's takedown attempts. Come on, guys, work, work. See, and right in all these positions, uh, Kyle Crutchmer, so he's the one that's trying to get that takedown. No offense coming from him. Dan Bergelot is separating him. Look at Dan's known. He separates guys pretty fast. He doesn't give you a ton of time. You've got to work hard, and he'll let you stay there. And he'll let you know that before the fight? Yes, he will. In the back, he tells you exactly what he's going to do. And Willis looking to continue doing what he's done very well in this fight. Putting together combinations, going to the body, sharp jab, backing up Crushmer. 
Good counterattack, showing that speed as well. And Jalil is now going towards, like I said, right. he's throwing those combinations, coming with that left hook up high. Terrific 10 minutes for Jaleel Willis, fighting like a guy who, who knows his back is against the proverbial wall. You put these positions, you gotta shine. They say like I said, they know the blueprint, show everyone, it's not gonna work. I need you to keep that damn chin down. Here's Jalil with that beautiful jab, right hand combination. He's been accurate with it throughout. Even when that left hand doesn't hit flush, it's still given a sharp jolt to Kyle Crutchmer. Beautiful left hand again, right on the jawline. Jalil Willis looking very good so far. You need far to knock him fight. out to get that takedown. One of the two, but the glass of water. All right. Jaleel Willis, <coughs> ready to go. Let's go. Kyle Crutchmer right, trying to protect his number eight ranking. You know, when you're looking at this, if you're in Crutchmer's corner, you gotta, you gotta say, I'm down 2-0. And I've gotta finish this fight, so where can I finish it? Can he take him down and finish him on the ground? I think that's his best route to victory because in the stand-up, Jaleel Willis has been the better fighter. It may be his best route to victory, but it's been an exercise in futility, John, as we mentioned. 0 for 5, heading into round 3 in the takedown department. And look at the strikes landed in round 2, John. And look at that. And it can, you're in the third. We're talking about percentages. 6 of 27 for 22%. That is not how you win a fight. Oh, there is a counter right hand. Did he punch him on the side? <laughs> Who can do that? I know, it's just amazing. Like, he's really trying to, do, you know, showing these combinations. There's a level change by Crutchmer, but again, denied by Willis. See, so now Crutchmer's taking a lot of damage. Tanks a little bit empty. Breathing hard, not an easy thing. And Willis is now slippery. It's just getting, just getting rougher. And again, naked shot. Defended by Willis Crutchmer trying to put all of his eggs in that takedown basket and now 0 for 8. But that was a, counting. That was a nice reshoot. Yep. He shot, he missed it, he reshot, and now he's into him. We'll see if he can get those hands together. It's not gonna happen. Come on, guys, keep busy, keep busy. See, when Dan Mergalata separates right, him here like this, they're in a 50-50 position. It's even, yeah, Jalil Wills is back. is against Cage, and Kyle's the one that wants to be there, but he's got to at least gain that advantage. Front kick by Willis again, just showcasing all of his striking. High fight IQ in this fight, really just putting it all together, sticking to the game plan and just mixing it up inside calf kick, followed by the jab. Not a lot of single shots, putting together the combinations, the footwork. And meanwhile, Crutchmer, again, trying desperately somehow to take Willis down. Yeah, he's been working really hard. That was a nice job of using his hands to close that gap. But already, Willis has turned him around to where his back, now they're towards the center of the cage. When you're in the center of the cage, not an easy thing to do when he's wet in the third round. Huge edge for Willis in total strikes landed. Backing Crutchmer up. left in the fight another takedown stuffed by Crutchmer finds himself on the back and into the butterfly guard now of Crutchmer but Willis who has uh, done everything he told us he was going to do talking about getting back into the win column he's now a minute 40 from doing just that well, he is and he's just had a fantastic fight but very smart calculated accurate with his shots here being in the top position.
this is a good place to be with Kyle Crutchman. Kyle's not a submission master. He's a good wrestler. He can try to roll and get himself out, but he's not going to be a danger off of his back. Yeah, three submission wins for Crutchman via Anaconda choke, arm triangle, and guillotine. So not from this position. Now Crutchman may be using the fence to wall walk, but Willis keeps the pressure on. Just over a minute left in the fight. Nice knee to the body by Willis. So good fight IQ there. In terms of stats, with 45 seconds left, two scream out at me. In terms of total punches landed, 61 to 17 for Willis. In terms of takedowns, 0 for 12 for Crutchmer. That's huge. That is the number that speaks volumes about how this fight is gone. Another kick from Willis. Crutchmer unable to get on track, unable to really move forward with any efficiency or effectiveness. Now, trip. Look, uh, trip takedown being uh, pursued by Willis, but now it's Crutchmer on, his, on the fence, and there's a old school foot stop, and Crutchmer avoids. But what a bounce back fight for Jaleel, the realist Willis. He was real effective. He was. That was a beautiful performance by Jaleel Willis. He had a lot of things going on. Uh, those two losses, getting the confidence to come in here against someone like Kyle Crutchmer and put on that kind of performance, that says a lot about him. He told us that he didn't do anything well in his past two fights because he didn't believe in himself or his so training. And John, he charged a thousand dollars fine for that. Oh, Ergley out of telling him you're going to have a little less uh, amount of uh, money for the holiday shopping, throwing that mouthpiece. But John, you talk about mental fortitude and the mental strength, and it goes on and on. We discuss, but. When you put your life on the line, and that's what they're doing there, you better be as mentally strong as you can possibly be. And he was tonight. He was tonight. And you, and you know, everyone thinks that, oh, because you're a fighter, you're so mentally strong. Well, fighters are like everyone else. They have, their, they have their strong moments, they have their weak moments. Take a look at those stats right there. Like you said, 83 strikes landed compared to 23. The punch is huge difference. That takedown attempts, zero for 12. That says everything about this fight. Great fight by Jaleel Willis. And Kyle Crutchmer can now commiserate with uh, Corey Henderson, who went 0 for 15 in the rematch with Vadim Nemkov. But let's take a look at some more of the highlights. You take a look at those shots. Crutchmer showed he's got, he definitely got a beard. That was a nice knee to the body. You can see bothered Crutchmer a little bit. Now, everything Jaleel Willis did, thought about, did a nice job preparing, setting himself up to be successful, landing good strikes. Nice to see a guy do that successful. Willis told us he is giving himself permission to win this fight. I think he executed a successful game plan. Let's find out from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go now to your three judges. Marcel Varela, Eric Colon, Dave Peabody. I'll have it exactly the same at 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision to Leo, the real Clinical, clean a sweep on the judges' scorecards as Jaleel Willis snaps a two-fight losing streak, sending Kyle Crutchmer to his first loss in four fights and uh, receiving all of the congratulations from his team. Jaleel Willis now four and two in Bellator, and that's how you bounce back. That is how you bounce back. That was a really and let's, a beautiful performance. And let's go back to Amanda Gill. Moro, what an incredible night here so far at Bellator 289. These prelims have been great. We still have the main card coming up tonight where not one but two belts are on the line. And we started with eight of the best Bantamweights in the world. Tonight we are down to four. After tonight we will have the final two to try to win a million dollars. Let's take a look at how we got here. The Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix features eight of the top 135ers in the world, all with their eyes on the $1 million prize. 
The quarterfinal action got underway at Bellator 279 with Patchy Mix taking on Kyoji Horiguchi. And Mix showed no love to the former Bantamweight champion as he advanced with a unanimous decision victory. I'm coming for that million. I'm coming for that belt. Then, in a showdown for the interim world title, Rafion Superstocks faced off against another former champion, Juan Archuleta. Oh. The Grand Prix action resumed at Bellator 282 with Magomed Magomedov facing Enrique Barzola. And his time. Got his legs engaged in that. There it is. He does it via guillotine choke in the fourth round. It will be Magomed Magomedov meeting Patchy Mix in the semifinals. The last quarterfinal matchup featured Danny Sabatello taking on Leandro Ego. The Italian gangster put on a clinic and dominated all five rounds to secure a unanimous decision victory and set up a highly anticipated showdown with Rafion Stotts. And there is the bracket. You see the final four. Let's start with the guys on the right-hand side because there has been so much talk about Rafion Stotts and Danny Sabatella, but we have Patchy Mix going up against Magomed Magomedov. Patchy Mix saying at the beginning of this tournament, he felt like he was overlooked, but he showed us what he was made of in that fight against Kyoji Horiguchi. Sergio, you have trained with Patchy Mix. We call him the human backpack for a reason. How dangerous is he going into tonight? Extremely dangerous. Uh, you saw his last fight with Horiguchi. You know, I've competed against Horiguchi. A very, very tough fight to deal with. A lot of movement. Patchy Mix went out there and did a great job. Excellent. We've talked a lot about the maturity of Patchy Mix, but what did you see in the Horiguchi fight that you had seen from him before in the past? What changes has he made in that fight? Uh, in that fight, I think he just really um, got used to getting hit at. You know, he didn't give those big reactions like how he usually does, and you can kind of see in his face he's a little frustrated. This time with, uh, with Horiguchi, he was calm, collective, he had an objective, and he got it done. Patchy Mix moving on after Horiguchi there. We saw Mega Medov do the same against Enrique Barzola. Enrique Barzola has a gas tank that can go forever. We saw Magomedov come out of that one with the win. How does he stack up against Mix tonight? He stacks up very well, but he's got to be very cautious and careful on where he puts his head in different positions, On also on how he gets up back to his feet if Patchy is able to get the takedown. Because what he does is he will give his back. He will turn and give his back to get back to his feet. That's not something he can do against Patchy Mix. He's good at takedown, but he also likes to shoot that high crotch. And that high crotch sometimes, you'll end up with your head on the outside right on the neck Patchy Mix will get to. Now on the feet, he also throws a lot of spinning attacks, which you're very familiar with spinning attacks. That, if you come up short, what happens? Oh, your back's getting taken all day. So he's got to be aware of the spinning attacks. He's got to be aware of his range. And like you said, not get into positions where it's, it's favorite towards Patchy Mix. You know, there's no room for error in this fight. These two are friends. They have a lot of respect for one another. A little different than this Stott Sabatello fight. Uh, but they say once that cage door closes, it will be an all-out war. Mora, we'll send it back down to you. Wrap up the prelims. All right, Amanda, it's been the night of the underdog thus far here at Bellator 289 prelims, and we are set now for our final preliminary matchup of the night in the flyweight division. The favorite, Denise Kielholtz, ranked number three, takes on Ilara Jowani. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to make her way to the cage, this is Ilara Jelani. Bringing in the 28-year-old Jelani from Brazil. And as the Brazilians, well, they more than defeated their World Cup soccer team today, getting upset by Croatia. But for Jelani, hey, this is her World Cup, an opportunity to knock off the number three ranked Kielholtz. And in a division which we will see the title rematch between Liz Carmouche and Juliana Velasquez later tonight. Hey, Jelani would love to upset Kielholtz and put herself in the so-called mix. Well, you can say she had a big upset in her last fight going against former title contender in Alejandro Lara. Here she was against Lara, and she used a beautiful attack, landing in the stand-up, mixing it up, taking her to the ground. When she got her hands on her, every time she got her hands closed, boom, hits the ground. That was a great win 
for Alara Jawani. She wants to do it one more time here against Gilholtz. Has won four of her last six fights, an aggressive fighter whose ground game continues to improve, and against, uh, well, a kickboxer, the pedigree of Gilholtz, she might just want to try to take it to the mat. And we now welcome the niece, Miss Denise Kielholtz, Bellator kickboxing champion, challenged Juliana Velasquez for the flyweight title when Velasquez was champion and suffered a split decision setback, but since then has lost to Kana Watanabe. So Kielholtz now trying to bounce back from recent adversity, but that fight with Velasquez, highly competitive. It was very competitive, and you know, she, she has had such a disadvantage as far as her reach in the fight, but she did such a good job of getting inside. It was just all the shots on the outside that she had to take to get to that position. I think in the end, that's what got her you know, in the judges' minds and gave it to Velasquez. But look, Denise Kielholz, as a stand-up fighter, she is fast, she's got power, and her ground game has gotten very good. She's got a couple of submission wins. It's not like she's lost down there. She's a black belt in judo. Yeah, returns to the Bellator cage for the first time since picking up a kickboxing win on October 29th, the same night her husband has eager just picked up a kickboxing victory. So a power couple of combat sports, and we get set for the final preliminary fight of the night here at Bellator 289. Number three ranked Denise Kielholz colliding with Alira Joao at flyweight. Yeah, and if you take a look, five foot three to five foot three, this is the first time for both fighters that they're not actually looking up and having to actually fire shots up at their opponent. Well, it's time for us to look up and say hello once again to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight from Mohegan Sun Arena, the time has come to conclude the Bellator 289 prelims, and we'll do it now with three five-minute rounds in the flyweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot three, weighing in 124.8 pounds, her professional record, 10 wins, six losses from Natal Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil. And across the cage, her adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot three, weighing in 124.2 pounds, the kickboxing world champion and former flyweight title challenger stands tonight at six and four. She's ranked at number three and hails from Amsterdam, Netherlands. Introducing the knees, Miss Dynamite. In charge of the action, your referee, Dan Murgliato. For Denise Kielholtz, four of her five finishes have come in the opening round. For Joani, six of her seven finishes have come in round number one. All right, ready? Ready? Let's go, ladies. Fight. Expect them to get started in a hurry here. An important matchup in the flyweight division, and exactly as advertised. Some mean, mean shots fired off the bat by Gilles there. And a counter left hook clips the job. Jawani by Gilles, but Jawani looking to fight fire with fire against a highly decorated stand up striker in Denise Gilles. My goodness, Jawani throwing gosh into the wind. Well, she's going after it. She just landed a nice, clean shot. Inside leg kick by Jawani. Remain calm under fire here in the opening minute of the first. And again, we will have the immediate rematch to determine the flyweight champion, Liz Carmouche and Juliana Velasquez. And again, she is really playing with fire, though, Jawani. The way she keeps her chin elevated against someone like Kilo, that counter could be there. Yeah, it could be, and she just landed a beautiful one-two combination on that chin. So, Jawani showing she can take shots. Yeah. But how many can you take? Hey, 
He's become a little bit more controlled, looking for those counters as Joani comes in with these big looping shots. She's starting to throw straight shots down the middle, and those are going to get there quicker. Joani, member of the Pitbull Brothers team, and has that Pitbull Brothers mentality. Kielorts used to, well, has trained a team Schreiber, and you know, Bob, Sch oh, wow, there's a, again, Jawani comes in with the combinations. Kilholtz with Bob Schreiber, the only man ever to be submitted by Vanderlei Silva. Believe it or not, there's a trivia <laughs> question a trivia. for you. Dirty Bob, man, you talk about a great guy. Bob Schreiber is just awesome. Wow, and he has to be impressed with Kilholtz's approach and her quick combinations. See, this is when we talk about, look at, Denise Kilholtz has settled into the fight now. She was being a little bit wild with Joani because Joani was going after and she was trying to throw big strikes. Now she's waiting for her and she's looking for the counters and she's being successful. Beautiful oh, right hand down the pipe. And then Joani does go upstairs, but again, not with the pop of a Kilholtz, but plenty of action right now. If, you know what, in terms of the strikes landed very even in terms of the connection weight and the output. So Joani hanging in there with Kielholz. I'll tell you what, Joani just hurt Kielholz. You could see her, she was trying to get her balance and she had to take multiple steps to do it. Just two minutes now left in an entertaining opening five minutes between Kielholz and Joani. <laughs> Kielholz tracking Joani. Oh, there Joani lands the left. A little bit flat, wasn't able to bring it around. A minute and a half left in the first round, and Kielholz trying to cut off that, stop the movement of Joani, but right now just following her and just, yeah, there's she, a kick. She needs to step off with that left foot out, cut off that movement of Joani. Exchange. Jawani looking to secure the neck of Gil Mokhtar, looking for that Uchimata there, which is another judo throw, Mr. Nice. McCarthy. Very nice. Nice job by Kiel Holtz to stop that. We saw a fighter, Ronda Rousey, really uh, utilize that to great advantage in her career. Yeah, there's another one out there, Kayla Harrison. She does sure, a good job. Sure. With that. And good Juliana job. Velasquez, there who we will go. see try to reclaim her flyweight title against Liz Carmouche. Coming up on the main card, 9 o'clock Eastern on Showtime. And what a loaded lineup to say goodbye to 2022 for Bellator MMA. Not only the rematch for the flyweight title, the semifinals of the Bellator Bantamweight World Grand Prix. And uh, we should get a barn burner to kick things off. Dalton Rasta, one of the biggest and brightest prospects on the Bellator roster, takes on Anthony Adams. Ten seconds, ten seconds. What did you like more in that first five minutes and why? Well, I'll tell you what, man, it was a very close round. Mm -hmm. You take a look, look at, at the it, numbers. Both landed, but if there was one thing that, you know, I look at, Kielholz had some good shots and she landed. She never really hurt Ioani. Ioani did hurt Kielholz in that hey, one exchange. That mountain of a man with the uh, hey, Dodgers, that, that's her husband, Hesdy Gershon, so a nasty kickboxer, and has also done a little mixed martial arts. Same with Bob Scriber there with the towel. By the way, Vanderlei Silva submitted him with a rear naked choke. He did the same to me at a Denny's restaurant in Tokyo, Japan, at the behest of Boss Rune, but that's a story for another night. There you go. But it's always good to have Boss as a friend. He wants everyone to choke. I, I may have had one or two uh, acai beers as well there, Big John. But here we go. So, again, uh, Kiel Holtz, Jawani, very competitive first frame. Very competitive. That was a very close round. Round number two, our final preliminary fight of the night. And again, we mentioned it, the night of the underdogs. And well, 
Joanne came in as the underdog in this fight and hung tough in that first five minutes. Definitely had her moments in the stand-up against someone who was very well versed in that department in Denise Kielholz. Nice counter left hook by Denise Kielholz on that. Joanne, when she throws, she throws so hard. She throws with everything she has, but she doesn't seem to get tired. Man, she took that right hand upstairs. Kind of like a pit bull, brother. Kind of like a pit bull, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Something in the water. She started by working the front, and they're putting together, but again, eats those shots down the middle, but someone has always dreamed to be a fighter and, and, and so appreciative of what the pit bull brothers have meant to her in her career. And of course, they're very happy with her work ethic and her rise as a mixed martial artist. Can understand why they're happy. She, she represents their school very well. Jab from Kielholtz. See, you would, you would think Denise wants to win. When, she, when you see Ioani going away in this direction to her right, Denise needs to cut her off and force her to step back towards her power hand, which is that right hand. And as this fight unfolds, and knowing Denise Kielholz the way we know, knowing how important each and every fight is that she just missed with the counter right, kind of approaching this fight, fighting like someone who's lost two in a row and doesn't want to make it three to a degree. You know, th th that is true. And one of the things that I'm really seeing is she, that was one of the first kicks. She really has not thrown hardly any kicks throughout the fight. <laughs> she is known for that. Yeah, former kickboxing champ who just picked up a win in the kickboxing ring in October, but Jawani sticks the jab. And yet very close in terms of the stats. We know the numbers don't tell the entire story, but they are, for the most part, an effective barometer. And uh, when you look at the numbers, kind of surprising in terms of the ability of Jawani, I would say, right now to take the fight to uh, Kielholz in the stand-up department. Or, or at least make it where it's as close as yes. it can be. I mean, it's, uh, she's throwing hard. She's she's in that position where she's hit Denise enough where Denise has got respect for the power. And, and the reason I say this is because, and again, fighters, you know, they, they tell you things in the moment, and I'm sure they're not always truthful when they're trying. Oh, she got her head snapped back by that left from Kilos, but Jawani uh, told us her BJJ or grappling would be the story of this fight. Well, she has tried to take downs, but it's been predominantly in the stand-up, and it's been a bit of a firefight. Boy, she comes in and she's winging shots, but she is eating shots yep. in this round. Overall, the cleaner shots have been landed by Denise Kielholz right now, and she's, she's finding a home for that right hand on the counter. And Jawani has been knocked out twice by Kana Watanabe and Vivian Pereira, but that was early in her career. In fact, that was in her professional debut. <laughs> a minute and a half left here in the second. And there, level change of the single leg and the takedown, but immediately back to her feet is Kielholz. And now Kielholz nice looking wizard. use the wizard to take the back. Over. Nice job by Denise Good Kielholz. Scramble. Great job by Joanne to land in top position. Great job by Ioanni in the end to end up in the top position. This, you saw Denise start to counter what she was doing. She went over the top with it, ends up now in guard. <laughs> she needs to break this position, take that arm off, get some posture, and get that right hand off of the ground underneath her back. So Kielholz was credited with the takedown. The scramble, though, results in Joani now working from the closed guard and referee Mergliata standing them up. 30 seconds left in the round. A little fast. Dan wants more. Dan Morgliata, 20 <laughs> seconds left here in the middle frame. I apologize. Once. Wow, and again, wild swinging. Got to be careful with that. So we are two-thirds of the way through this flyweight matchup here at Mohegan Sun Arena. Spinning back fist by Jawadi. And speaking.
ranking of the flyweight division. Of course, coming up later tonight, part of the Bellator 289 main card. There she is, 12 years in the game. And in her fourth crack at a major MMA title, Liz Carmouche dethroned the previously undefeated Juliana Velasquez in April in Hawaii. But it was a controversial stoppage. And Juliana Velasquez, she filed an appeal that was denied by the Hawaiian Commission. And she has now said that she is double motivated. She is going to come out hyper aggressive. And in this immediate rematch, both champion and now challenger want to remove any doubt as to who's the best 125 pound fighter in Bellator MMA. And that's still to come tonight on Showtime. Potential future title challenger. We've seen Kilholtz already get one crack. Jelani would love to work her way into title contention. Final five minutes, John. Final five minutes. Both ladies should be going after it because this fight is incredibly close. On your scorecard, does it come down to this round? Uh, my scorecard does. I have each I have each lady with a round, so this is the one they both need it. You're the analyst. What what adjustments or what what would you like to see more of from either fighter here in the third round as Kilholtz dropping Jawani momentarily? I, I mean, you want to see an uptick in the offense from Kilholtz? Yeah, and I want to see more straight right hands. Quit. Looping that right hand over the top. Straight right hands, especially when she comes in, are gonna get there fast, and they're gonna find the target just like it did in putting her on her can. And again, nice. Gilholtz popping Jelani's head back with the one-two. And I know we mentioned it in breaking down the Velasquez Carmouche first fight. You wanted to see from Velasquez the three and the four, similar maybe to what Kilos could get busy with. That's exactly it. Right now you're seeing Denise respond. It's the three and the four that the fighter is not prepared for. They've already put their hands in the position to stop. So Take down a depth level. And again, Kilhoff's trying to get up, using, using the wizard, trying to get that judo throw, trying to end up in dominant position. Another scramble back taken, but again, what a great scramble here. And the crowd appreciating it as we all are. Kilhoff's, and again, Jawadi is the one that ends up in top position. That was the exact same scenario that happened in the second round when they hit the ground, so. Interestingly, Denise Kielholz spent some time in Brazil working with one of the most dangerous strikers in heavyweight history, Pedro Hizzo. Going on her own down to Brazil for a little extra sauce on her striking, but now she finds herself on her back. Zawani trying to work. She's unable to break and get her posture free. Dan Nguyenawada stands him back up. Again, combinations, straight shots by Kiel Holtz. If you're Iwani, just keep going with what you're doing because when you're getting into that clinch, you're the one coming out on top. Get that takedown again. Nice delay by Ioani, but it's still, she was a little bit short on that. Jawadi, as you mentioned, John, coming off a win over former title challenger Alejandra Lara. Oh, wild. Voice right herself open. Up. Yeah, very open. And that right there, that's what Denise Kiel holds, I think, she do. Everything straight down the pipe. Straight jab, straight right hand. Here they go again. Well, again, but it's again, it's it's Kielholz initiating the takedowns or the, the attempts, and yet it's Jawani that usually ends up in top position. Absolutely. Denise with her arm in that position, she's not going to just be, she's 
not being able to do anything except hold Yolani's head. And she's going to find this. She's going to be able to slip out of that, which she just did. Now she's and she's back. got both hooks in, and now she's taken the back of Kielholtz. And Ilara Jawani with three submission wins, including two via rear naked choke. Kielholtz has been submitted three times. No grammar thumb, no grammar thumb. They're going to gloves. She's, she's grabbing the inside of the gloves right now. And not legal. A close competitive matchup now in the final 30 seconds. Joanna. Thank you. Jawani, excuse me, two of three in the takedown to, or make that kill two of three. Jawani actually went for four, but it's, even saying that, she's in the dominant position, and she's hung very well in the stand-up, John. Very close fight. But she's in the dominant position, but she's done nothing right. Whole. And we saw Lezioni <laughs> earlier. So, John, okay, down 15 minutes, fight is over. They exchange pleasantries. Um, how do you have it, sir? Yeah, I said I had that even going into that third round, and although Ioanni got the takedown as far as she got the back, all she did was seat belt position and hold while she was getting hit, not with hard shots, but hit with shots by Denise Kilholtz. I try to tell fighters, just don't ever just hold. Nice clean shot. That's where she stumbled. That was in the first round. That was what gave the round to Ioanni, in my opinion. In the second round, Denise Keoholtz came back and had a much better round, landed the better shots. Straight shots down the middle, put her on her butt. You see, that happened in the third round here. That's a big difference maker, in my opinion. I have Denise Keoholtz winning this 29-28. championship hoping that she has done enough to remain in the hunt came into this fight ranked number three Joanne wasn't ranked but she gave Kielholtz a tough fight all right will we see another upset here at the Bellator 289 prelims Michael C Williams has the answer Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we go now to your three judges. Your first judge, Brian Miner, scores the fight 29 to 28. He sees the fight for Giovanni. Your second judge at cage side, Eric Colon, scores it 30 27. He sees the fight for Keelholtz. Your third and final judge, Doug Crosby, scores the fight 30 to 27. Seeing the fight for the winner by split decision, Ilana Johanni. Upset alert, Big John McCarthy. What do you have to say for yourself, BJM? I'm saying it. Silence <laughs> speaks volumes. Ilana Johanni knocks off number three, Denise Kielholtz. How do, you, how do you knock somebody down? They don't knock you down. You win most of the stand-up, and there's a ground position where they have your back, and you land all the shots, and you lose. So you're saying bah humbug to that decision. It's not good. 
All right, Alara Jawani closes out the prelims with an upset win, albeit, albeit via controversial decision. And coming up, a loaded Bellator 289 main card. It is the semifinals of the Bellator World Grand Prix and the rematch for the flyweight championship. Carmouche defends against Velasquez. And Dalton Rushdell looks to remain unbeaten against Anthony Adams to kick things off. Nine Eastern, only on Showtime. Ladies and gentlemen, in the semifinals, stop against Sabatello. Congratulations, you won yourself a whooping. There's bad blood in the Bantamweight Grand Prix. This is my right. Interim champ, Rapion Stotts. We've got a new champion! Faces his nemesis, Danny Sabatello. Plus, flyweight champ Liz Carmouche faces former champ Juliana Velasquez in a flyweight title rematch. I cannot wait! Bellator MMA, tonight, live on Showtime. The sequel is always better than the original, and that is why Velasquez versus Garmouche matters. I gotta tell you guys, do you remember this first contest? Listen, Velasquez did everything right. Her strategy was good, her positions were fantastic. She's winning the contest on a 10-9 must system. At the point where the fight was stopped, it looked as though Velasquez no longer had to beat her opponent. She just had to beat the timekeeper. Well, not so fast. There's a reason when they tell you you're fighting for 25 minutes, those minutes matter because Kermouche gets into a dominant position. She gets on top, she passes to side control, she starts to pin the arms down. All of a sudden, Kermouche, who had not won a round, in my opinion, is now in her first dominant spot of the entire fight. Oh, by the way, referee Mike Beltron stepped in and stopped it, which means Kermouche becomes your new champion. Velasquez didn't like that. She thought it was an early stoppage. She admitted she was in a bad position, but she didn't believe she had taken enough damage. So what do you do in those spots? You have a new champion, that's for sure, but the thing that you have as a byproduct is you now have a very clear number one contender, Velasquez versus Carmouche, part two. Put the controversy aside, put the belt up for grabs, and that is why it matters. Guy Fieri's fit nephew from the Jersey Shore. That's actually f hilarious. Um, props on that tweet, but if I saw you in person, I'd still have to beat the out of you. I eat adversity for breakfast. You know, my manager called me five days ago, said, you want to fight Brett Johns on five days' notice? I said, don't ask dumb questions. Make it happen. The Italian gangster, Dan Hayes. I'm a total. You're talking about wanting a ranked fighter, so is there any names that you're looking at? Yeah, Jornel Lugo or uh, Josh Hills. I can face either of them. But the problem is with my style, I'm just so dominant. And in any sport, when you're very dominant, it, it comes off boring. If you're watching a football game and the score is 54-0, it's boring. You deal with it. Sorry for being really good. It was a really good performance by me. Sorry for swearing about that. But Jornel Lugo's an absolute stud. And for me to do that to a guy like him, I can be any body. And now Leandro Higo is next. It's a perfect matchup, me and him. Because you look at him, he sucks you look at me and i'm really good let's go i understand when people say foolish things to promote themselves but this guy is pretty idiotic um i haven't said anything idiotic when i talk trash it's not trash talk it's fact talk when i say he goes sucks that's a fact i'm not promoting anything he does suck what do you want from me don't take it up with me take it up with him you know i know a lot of people are going to hate me but a lot of people are also so it is what it is um, I think people are going to tune in and just watch a really good show. Shut the f*** up, Higo. No one's talking to you.
I want to torture him first. You know, this is a guy that's disrespectful to MMA. He misses weight all the time like a little And even if he misses weight by a large margin and the commission doesn't sanction it, I'm going to find him in the parking lot and put his head through a car window. So either way, we're fighting June 24th. <laughs> My coaches are going to get mad at this, but in that fifth round, I started picturing stats. I got ahead of myself against Higo, and I just started picturing stats of what I'm going to do to this mother And I'm going to bash stats' face in I was told if I swore in my post-fight interview, I might get fined, so. It's a good thing I don't give a f I just beat an absolute animal, and not one of you are gonna do it. You wanna do something? Come in here right now and do something. In the semifinals, you will have the Italian gangster, Danny Sabatello, against Rafion Superstar. You think that people are going to have your back this fight? You think people are going to be your fan? It's not about you. No one gives a f about you. They just hate me. This fight is all about me. It's who's Danny Sabatello fighting. It just so happens to be you. Who's the I'm better wrestler, every, by the way? I'm a better wrestler. I, we can go wrestle right now. I'd be them. But, I mean, obviously. Let's go right now. No, 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 he sounds like Eddie Alvarez after he sucked off a helium balloon. Kind of funny. Um, again, uh, say that's my face. I'm not a hard guy to find. Go down to Fort Lauderdale, look for a guy with a sick tan, great hair, surrounded by beautiful women. Come say it to my face and we'll see what happens. the ground, he gets put out right there. Rafion actually hits him and brings him back, that knee. Never saw it, you see his leg go stanky on him right there. Out. Now an overhand right, wants it out, be back pedaling, like she's in big trouble. Liz Carmo's piling it on. Kevin McDonald taking a close look. Lottie 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 shots are getting in and it's over. It's over. Watch these shots. A lot of pressure in the beginning. The inside leg kick, you see it squares cut off. That left hand, right hand starts it off. She's buzzed right there. You see her starting to go back. She's not, that right hand was the one. That's the one that really started to seal the deal. Liz kept on going after it. Crushed her space a little bit, but she just started lighting her up. Good stoppage by Kevin McDonald. How do you have it after 10 minutes, John? Oh, and again, Velasquez. Staggering Ruth, hurting stop, Ruth, stop, stop. and this. Stop. She got hit to the groin. Take a look. Oh, just froze it. Just froze it. Oh, Patchy took the round over because James just wasn't able to be offensive. Here goes Patchy. Jumping for the guillotine. This has been the guillotine. See James Gallagher. He's rolling over. That is on. Let's take a look at this, and this is where we talk about, you see, when he jumps, it's because he knows he has his hands in a position where he feels confident that it's going to be tight. And once he wraps those legs, now he's extending Gallagher's body back, and you know that's a trying to relieve pressure there. It goes all the way over. Now it is not a relief of pressure. It intensifies. That is a beautiful submission win by Patchy Mix. I mean, you want that sense of urgency, and there's a double left and a right hand and another. Dalton Rasta could be behind Camaro, Romero Cotton. Look at that Superman punch. Beautifully executed. Romero ate it. But in the end, that left hook puts him down and he hits his head on the canvas. Hands go over the head. That's why Jason Herzog stopped it. Here comes the Superman punch. It lands. Beautiful right hand, but watch the left hook. It tags him right on the jawline. Watch this at real speed. Let's see it live. Superman punch comes, boom, and all of a sudden, it's over. 
When you have mixed versus Magomedov, you've got a reach guy that wants to stay on the outside and mix. You've got a guy who's smaller and more powerful than Magomedov who's got to get inside which one wins. It's a day old question, but that is why it matters. When I watch Mitch, one of the great weapons that he has is his physiology. Mix will wear you out on your feet. He'll make you want to take him to the ground. However, strategically, you know, one thing about dealing with Mix is don't go to the ground with him. Mix will put you in a, a variety of different positions from his back, but he'll strike you the entire time. Now, where that becomes relevant is when you're dealing with Magomedov. He's a very good kickboxer, but he can protect himself on the ground. There's a lot of fighters who, if you could just keep them out there long enough, they'll beat themselves. They'll get frustrated, they'll work up, they'll go for some Hail Mary pass, and it will cost them the entire contest. Magomedov's very disciplined. Can Magomedov stick to the script? Can he deal with the strikes while being attacked with submissions? History says he's very good at that. Mix is a whole nother problem, and that is why it matters. Single one pace, he just walks by. Now Kielholz does have it on the ground. Dynamic start by Miss Dynamite. And she has the win. She has the win. It's all over. Just nicely done. Right on the button. Drops her to her knees. It's the key lock. Get the tap. All done. Look at the left thigh area of Beck Rollins. You can see that one kick that put her on the ground. Damaged her big time. Going for the knee bar. Yep. And right here, she sets up this knee bar attempt. Now she's got it locked in. Now she extends her hips. And that's why you see Beck Rawlings tap. Use it whenever he needs it. And wow. There's a tap. What a submission by Kyle Crutchburn. Takes laces from the neck to the arm. It's an anaconda is what he's doing. He never gets the legs, doesn't have to. Leads with the left hand. Ham is down. Moss hurt Ham. Ham showing up as well with the ground and pound. And you can see Ham is trying to control the wrist. He's oh, and Ham continues to get hammered. Watch the elbow come over the top. That's a beautiful technique by Cody Law. Very smart, very effective. And you saw him repeatedly land that left elbow, eventually putting Ham out. Meanwhile, let's the only fishing for a submission attempt. Benjelani caught up. I guard it. It's not a triangle yet, but he has the ability to Now he's looking for a triangle. As the triangle choke. Ten seconds left. Will Benjelani be able to survive the round? He's going to survive it. No, he doesn't. Benjelani's got a problem. If he keeps his arm to the outside, he can keep the pressure off of the choke. But once his arm crosses, you see that arm all the way across. Now there's pressure on both sides. He's in trouble. There's your tax. Grappling immediately in the strong takedown. The, the difference being an NCAA All-American is an extraordinary accomplishment. And when you're talking about the freestyle, Olympic level, this is a different place. That down he went there. Immediately steps over the full and, and like I said, right now he's going into a submission. It's going to be on. Yep. He's got that's it. Beautiful job of that pushing that arm over. Gets the choke, gets the body lock, goes up. Turns, beautiful takedown, now jumps into the mount position, and he just holds on to that squeeze, right over, gets it on tight, that arm going across the neck, choking with his own arm. Beautiful job by Pat Down. Keep it, which once again he can not And that's the whole thing. Oh, big knee! This could be it, it's not a shot. It is all over! You see Casbell going, you see that change. Wow. Look at the head go down, and the knee comes straight up into Peter Ishiguro. He never saw the knee coming. Miller defending well thus far, but what has to be careful, though. It's in trouble. Arm, yeah, that arm is underneath. And Miller looking to submit. Oh, and Field submits Mariah Miller. She ends up getting the tap. There it is, locked right there. 
Stas versus Sabatello, guys, here is why it matters. Look, I gotta put myself in this. I am a leader within the grappling community and I wanted Stas. The first time that I ever saw him compete, I remember being in the second row and going, okay, this guy is going to be champion. So now I gotta stalk him because I don't know who he is. He finally goes over to Coach Rufus. So I go to Coach Rufus to get to the bottom of who this guy is so that I get his phone number and I can bring him